and uh, we're having the first day of uh, the Watani Web Week and some uh, bedtime stories. Uh, we welcome everyone. We have uh, international guest speakers. We have the guru of lamella corneal surgery, Dr. Mark Terry from uh, the United States. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Vincenzo Sarnicola, the guru of Italy, uh, and uh, a guru of lamella surgery from uh, uh, Italy. We have uh, Dr. Rajesh Fogla, uh, one of the best teachers all over the world regarding the lamellar corneal surgery. And we have also uh, Dr. Lamise Baidun, uh, who's uh, speaking from Germany. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome here for this uh, interesting meeting. And uh, we are going to uh, first begin with uh, an Alcon talk on uh, dry eye, who's going to present it uh, by Dr. Mohammed Abu Rawash. Welcome, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you, Dr. Hazim. Thanks for the panel. And uh, it's my pleasure to be with you today for uh, this uh, Watani Web Week. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Mohammed Abu Rawash. I'm the product manager for Dry Eye and Ocular Health in Alcon. And uh, I'm going to uh, walk you through the coming 10 minutes for the intelligent delivery system of our Sustain Ultra. And I'm going to share my screen. Here is my content. I'm uh, going to start with Sustain Ultra unique formulation and uh, how is the ingredients of Sustain Ultra. Then I'm moving to the intelligent delivery system of Sustain Ultra, the mechanism of action. Uh, then we move to how it uh, improves the comfortability and quality of life of patients and the mucin layer restoration and superiority versus uh, sodium hyaluronate. And finally, I will shed some light about the drop tainer technology we have in Sustain Ultra and all Alcon drops. The first uh, point is my Sustain Ultra unique formulation. Uh, we say that Sustain Ultra is, is, is not only one polymer or a single lubricant, it's a, it's a system of uh, essential electrolytes of demulcents and of HP guarporate and sorbitol, which are the main component for the intelligent delivery system. So we have the sodium chloride, potassium chloride as essential electrolytes that are mimic the natural tears component as much as we can. Then we have polyethylene glycol 400 and propylene glycol that works as demulcents, lubricants, to have the mucomimetic effect to compensate post aqueous and mucin layer. And here are the three HP guar, porate, and sorbitol, the three members of the intelligent delivery system. As we know that HP guar is a chemically modified guar uh, gum, which is a natural polysaccharide, comes from a plant origin, and it has the ability to form a viscous solution at low concentration, mainly with it cross-linking with uh, metal ions like porate. So we have HP guar and porate that form a cross-linked elastic matrix to work as a protective shield to cover the corneal surface and allow the demulsion to distribute over the damaged ocular parts in the ocular surface. So what is the role here of sorbitol? Sorbitol is used, is used to optimize the viscosity of the sustained ultra in the dropper, in the bottle. So as we know, or as we said that porate with HP guarzi form an elastic matrix that it changes the viscosity based on the pH level of the human natural tears. So the presence of sorbitol inside the drops will prevent this matrix formation. So to keep the normal viscosity at the bottle, which will ensure a smooth installation in the eye for the dropper. Then when we move to, uh, the, uh, to putting sustained ultra inside the eye, the sorbitol will be released to interact with the divalent ions present in the natural tears, allow the matrix to reform again and to form the protective shield over the eye to allow the distribution of post emulsions, polyethylene glycol and propylene glycol to provide extended protection and long-term uh, coverage. Then we go to the practical life, to the real life, what will be the impact of such intelligent delivery system on our patients. So we have a survey that has been done over 3,000 of patients in 2009 across US and Canada. It was, uh, it was objected to ask for the effectiveness and acceptability for Sustain Ultra for patients who were going already on different types of lubricants. And when we switch at, to uh, Sustain Ultra, we assess the main uh, activities that is related to dry eye, which is uh, watching TV, using computer, reading, and night driving. 
And as we see 75% of patients involved in such surveys, they felt that watching TV and using computer was better. They felt improvement in reading. They can read longer after using Sustain Ultra. They can drive at night much better after Sustain Ultra, more than 60% of patients. Another point is the mucin rail restoration. This was a very interesting uh, clinical trial, which is Aguilar has been done in Argentina in 2011. The objective was to evaluate the efficacy of Sustain Ultra in patients with squamous metaplasia, 50 patients that were assessed for tear breakup time, corneal and conjunctival staining, impression cytology, which is measurement of goblet cell density score. At baseline, then at one month, two months, and three months. So the total period of the trial was three months. And the goblet cell score, it was, it was scored from zero to three, where zero is normal and three is almost absence of goblet cells. Here was the result. As we see, consistent reduction in the goblet cell score from months to months until we reached 50% decrease in goblet cell density score at month three, which means 50% improvement in the goblet cell density, which means more quality, more improvement for the tier quality by mucin production. We go to the another clinical trial which compares sodium hyaluronate versus HP guar. This trial was, uh, was mainly to assess a new product which is a mix between HP guar and sodium hyaluronate which is actually our sustained hydration product which is not registered yet in Egypt. And this clinical trial was to evaluate this product versus each of its separate components. So we were comparing sodium hyaluronate and HP guar uh, mix versus sodium hyaluronate alone versus HP guar alone. And here was the main parameters to assess. The difference is hydration protection and moist retention. It was in vitro a clinical trial that has been done on cultured human corneal epithelial cells where we treat the cultured human epithelial cells with the three polymers then we allow a condition for dryness to see the percentage of viable cells after the drying conditions. Then on the same viable cells, we applied again an insult with a detergent to increase the dryness level. Then we counted again the percentage of viable cells to see how would be the moist retention for both uh, or for the three molecules. Here are the results. Of course, it will be expected that when we add sodium hyaluronate to HP guar, we will have the best results. We will have higher hydration protection and higher moist retention. But the interesting here is that the comparison between HP guar and sodium hyaluronate was in favor of HP guar, which has more better hydration protection and more better moist retention. Last point here, I, I, wanna, I wanna confirm and emphasize the drop tainer technology for all Alcom products, not only Stain Ultra. As you see in the, in the pictures here, there is no need to put any pressure on both sides of the bottle or no need to squeeze the dropper, just gentle press on the bottom of the bottle, it will release only one drop. I think this technology is very important mainly with sustained gel as well, because I know that we have a lot of complaints from sustained gel sometimes that the patient apply many drops so he, he feels some blurring of vision. So it is our advice to all patients to just use this drop tainer technology, just gentle press on the bottom of the bottle, it will release only one drop. And this criteria is for all Alcom products, by the way. So in conclusion, Sustain Ultra is a unique formulation that gives immediate and long-lasting relief from dry eye system symptoms. It restores both aqueous and mucin layer to improve term tear film stability and patient's comfort. It has intelligent delivery system formulated to adjust to, Asian, to each patient's individual pH, whereas the viscosity of the thin gel inside the eye, it will increase by increasing the pH level and the dryness level of each patient. So we say that Sustain Ultra has in the eye gelling effect. It has a higher hydration protection and moist retention. If we compare it to sodium hyaluronate, you can use it safely for six months after opening from the, from the time we open the dropper. We can use it for six months along with the drop tainer technology. So it will be very economic over long-term use. Of course, it's safe with contact lenses. We, we just wanted to emphasize that this technology, this intelligent delivery system is same for sustained ultra and for sustained, for sustained gel. Just the difference here is Sustangel has a higher concentration of HP guar to be more viscous for the severe cases. Here, I think I'm done with my presentation. I would uh, like to thank you all and thanks for the panel. And I wish you a very successful event over this week. Thank you. And I hand over to Dr. Hazem.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohamed Abrash, for this nice presentation of uh, uh, Alcom products. Now we're going to uh, share with you a video uh, of our uh, uh, chairman of the hospital, uh, Professor Dr. Fathi Fauzi, and uh, then we'll start our uh, session shortly after. Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome you to the ninth edition of Watani Ophthalmology Summit. Unfortunately, this year, 2020, we cannot meet face to face because of the spread of coronavirus. Instead, we'll have the Watani Web Week. The Watani Web Week is a week long virtual meeting that features seven different daily sessions in the period between the 17th and the 23rd of October, 2020. Every day at 9 p.m. Cairo time, that's GMT plus two. This meeting is featuring 18 eminent international speakers. Our event will start with world-class cornea session on Saturday, discussing the state of the art, both anterior and posterior lamellar cornea surgery. On Sunday, a great retina panel will be discussing the surgical and the medical approaches to the management of the most encountered retina pathology we meet in our practice. On Monday, we will have the pediatric ophthalmology session focusing on the different approaches to ocular deviation correction surgeries. On Tuesday, we have the annual return of one of our most popular sessions the best of botany uh, grand rounds, with 11 of our most challenging and interesting cases competing for the first three places. On Wednesday, it's the glaucoma session. Our international experts in glaucoma will be discussing the surgical complications in glaucoma management. And on Thursday, this is the day you are, you are waiting for, the de debate time session with eight international speakers debating the most controversial topics in cataract and refractive surgery. And finally, on Friday, we have the online live surgery, not FACO and LASIK, but this time will be different subspecialties, focusing on strabismus and glaucoma surgery. Thank you, everybody. I'm looking forward to meeting you online starting Saturday the 17th of October at 9 p.m. And thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Fatih, for this uh, uh, review. And uh, now we're going to start our session. Thank you very much, Dr. Fatih, for this video. And we're going to start the session, uh, the anterior lamellar corneal surgery uh, state of art. And we'll start with uh, Dr. Rajesh Fogla. Without further uh, introduction, anterior lamellar keratoplasty techniques in corneal surgery. Dr. Rajesh? Sure. The slides are visible? Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everybody. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Al Watani Eye Center for inviting me to be part of this Watani Web Week. I would like to thank Hazem as well for involving me in this session. I will be sharing with you the anterior lamellar keratoplasty techniques, the surgical. We have come a long way from penetrating keratoplasty and currently penetrating keratoplasty is still the most frequently performed corneal transplantation procedure. However, in the past two decades, we have witnessed the emergence of component corneal surgery, various anterior lamellar keratoplasty procedures and endothelial keratoplasty surgical techniques have evolved. And for the anterior lamellar keratoplasty, the techniques can be divided into the superficial anterior lamellar keratoplasty when you are uh, replacing the anterior 200 microns of the cornea using either the microkeratome or the femtosecond laser. You can do a midstromal or anterior lamellar keratoplasty between 200 to 400 microns, which can again be done using manual techniques or the microkeratome or sometimes using the femtosecond laser. And you have the deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, which is within 100 microns of the decimus membrane. 
you carry down the dissection and this can be done either using stromal injection of air fluid or viscoelastic or using uh, manual techniques. The advantage of anterior lamellar keratoplasty is that you retain the healthy host endothelium, thereby you avoid endothelial rejection and a longer graft survival. The overall duration of steroid therapy is also less compared to a full thickness graft, thereby reducing the incidence of cataract and glaucoma. You, have, uh, you can do larger grafts without having the risk of rejection. And also getting a tissue from the eye bank is easier because you don't need tissues with higher cell counts. Uh, practically any condition with healthy endothelium, you can carry out an anterior lamellar keratoplasty. The common indications being ectatic disorders and corneal scars. And occasionally we do, we do it also for corneal dystrophies and degenerations. Sometimes we combine with ocular surface reconstruction and uh, certain infections not responding to medical therapy can also be amenable to doing an anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Pre-operative evaluation, you do a detailed slip lamp examination, look at the extent of the pathology, the depth of the scar, any presence of corneal vascularization or limbal stem cell deficiency, and also look at the lid margins. In terms of diagnostic tests, it's important that we know the regional pathometry across the cornea, which can help us decide as to the diameter of the trifine that we are going to use. I like to do a corneal anterior segment OCT in all our cases to look at the cornea in cross section, and if you have any involvement of the decimate membrane with the scar, it can help you decide which surgical technique to employ. Uh, specular microscopy, if possible, can be done to assess the health of the endothelium. And it's important to document the condition free of and post of using slit lamp photographs. In terms of doing the superficial anterior lamellar keratoplasty, if the pathology uh, extends up to the anterior 200 microns, you can think about doing this technique. For lesions which are fairly superficial, extending less than 100 microns, they can be dealt by using an excimo phototherapeutic keratectomy. But any lesion which is more dense or irregular and extends deeper, you can think about doing this anterior lamellar, superficial anterior lamellar keratoplasty. This is a case of a 16 year old female with history of respocular corneal dystrophy, for which she has already undergone two prior excimo PTK procedures. Her current uh, best corrected vision was 624 with a plus six hyperopic correction and the pachymetry overall was 415 microns. And on anterior segment OCT, the lesions extended up to a depth of 111 microns. So we did a two-stage technique, where in the first stage, you just make a, a 140 micron LASIK flap, and then you place the flap back into position, let it heal, and you come back three months later, and then you, in the center part of the cornea, you do a partial seven millimeter trifination, remove the anterior cap, and use the microkeratome to prepare a free uh, donor cap of 140 microns, punch out a, a similar size corneal button and replace it in the center. And this is what we will see in this video. So this is the patient. We, in the first stage, we went ahead, we made a nine millimeter flap, lifted the flap. And you can see after you lift the flap, the rest of the cornea is clear. We did it in both eyes. And then when you come back, so this is the post-op appearance where you can see the margins of the flap. And when you come back, you prepare a free cap from the donor cornea using a 140 micron head. And then on the host cornea, you can go back, mark the outline of the flap so that you have an idea of where you're trifining. Then do a central partial trifination. And you can lift up this central flap, which, which has the uh, corneal pathology. And once you lift it up, you can see that the base is clear and your edges are vertical because of the trifination. The donor free cap that you have created with the microkeratome, you place it on a punch block and uh, use a similar size trifine to punch out a, a donor graph. And this can then be placed on the bed and you can just, uh, you know, just like you uh, settle down a LASIK flap, you can iron out the, uh, the donor graph and once and make the edges dry and then put a bandage contact lens. So the sorry. So this is another case where you have a corneal scar following a central corneal infection, and the scar was going up to 214 microns depth. So in this case, we decided to use a femtosecond laser. So we made a so you don't need to do it in two stages, unlike the microkeratome. Here with a single stage, we prepared, we made a cut in the host cornea. And then on the donor cornea, we prepared a similar thickness donor button. 
the edges were uh, posteriorly angulated at 150 degrees, which means that the posterior uh, circumference was greater than the anterior circumference. And that small peripheral ledge allowed the donor button to sit very securely in position. So that's the post of appearance. You can see there's a nice clear cornea. On the anterior segment OCT, you can see the edges are very well opposed. And this patient had uh, corrected distance visual acuity of 2020. And the other option is later on, you can go ahead and do a uh, surface ablation to correct any diffractive errors if required. The other uh, surgical technique of doing an, um, a mid stromal depth anterior lamellar keratoplasty when the pathology extends beyond 200 microns, you can either use manual microkeratom or the femtosecond laser. So, here, this is a case of uh, uh, granular dystrophy where the microkeratome was used to create a flap of about 250 microns and a uh, donor tissue was prepared similarly and it was placed into position. You have to secure it with sutures. The disadvantage of this is that depending on the curvature of the host and the donor, you can have a mismatch of the size of the flap uh, and the size of the donor cap. And in that scenario, the apposition uh, can be a little challenging if the bed is larger and the cap is smaller. Uh, so this is another case where the pathology was extending deeper. So here we use the femtosecond laser to do the dissection. And uh, because the depth was greater than 200 microns, we did not leave it sutureless. We placed sutures to secure the donor graft into position. And this is the other technique which you can do, which is also called as a hemi-automated lamellar keratoplasty. So so this is a case of macular dystrophy where the pathology was extending up to about uh, 350, 400 microns. So we did a partial thickness trephination. That's the pre-op corneal thickness. It's about 400 microns. So we did the partial thickness trephination, did an anterior lamellar dissection to remove uh, anterior 50% of the tissue. So once we did that, we repeated the pachymetry and we found that uh, we have still have 192 microns and we could see some stromal lesions. So we went ahead and did a uh, peripheral groove, after which we use this stromal pocket forceps to carry the groove along the trephination edge. And then we carried on the uh, lamellar dissection. And you can see that the bed is fairly smooth. And at the end, this is the bed that's left behind. And uh, we could, and the, the residual stroma was quite clear. We did the pachymetry measurement again, and we found that our residual bed is only about 85 to 90 microns. And we, for the donor tissue, we placed the donor uh, cornea onto an artificial chamber, used a 350 micron uh, head, microkeratom head to prepare the cap. And this was punched out of the same diameter as the trephination that we had prepared. And this was placed on the bed and this was sutured. The advantage of this technique is the bed would be uh, a manual dissection, but because you prepare the donor with the microkeratom, the donor under surface would be much smoother than what you prepare manually. So you will have uh, the, uh, between the two surfaces, one surface will be much more smoother. So it will be, it will definitely give you better results than doing both the surfaces using the manual technique. The deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, which uh, my colleague, Professor Sarnikola will again be covering in detail, is any technique where you go close to the decimates membrane within 100 microns. And in this, uh, you have, uh, either you expose the predecimates layer or you go very close to the predecimates layer. So in terms of exposing the predecimates layer, also earlier referred to as DDAL, uh, this can be achieved either by injecting stromal uh, uh, injection of air, which is called the big bubble, or you can use inject cohesive viscoelastic when it is termed as the visco bubble, or you can even inject fluid to reach this plane. And a near DM dissection is something that you do uh, manual dissection. And if you have intraoperative OCT, you can even use that to guide you to reach very close to the decimus membrane. There is a new surgical classification that's been described by Dr. San Nicola. I'm pretty sure he'll be uh, uh, speaking about it in detail in his presentation. The big bubble technique was described by uh, Dr. Anwar, Mohammed Anwar and Klaas Tichman uh, back in 2002. And here you inject air into the deep stroma at about 85, 90% depth using a 27 gauge needle. And you create this bubble, which originally we thought was between the stroma and the decimus membrane. Experimental work by uh, Professor Haminda Dua showed that uh, 
the surgical plane that you get, there is another layer which is termed as the pre-decimates layer or the duas layer. So when you get a type one bubble which starts in the center and it expands concentrically outward, the plane is between the stroma and the pre-decimates layer. The second type is the type two bubble, which has a very clear margin. It can go across the cornea. And here the plane is between the pre-decimates layer and the decimates membrane. And the third type, and the third type is something which is a mix of the two, which starts as a type one and ends up as a type two bubble. Uh, instead of the needle, if you use any of the blunt tip cannula with the bottom port, the risk of complications are lower, and maybe the success rate for achieve a big bubble will be higher, especially during the learning curve. Uh, for air injection, uh, uh, studies have shown that it should be avoided in eyes which have extreme thinning below 220 microns thickness, or if you have scars involving the decimus membrane, very advanced keratoconus, and if even if you have macular dystrophy, because of the deposits in the pre-decimates layer, it reduces its elasticity and you can have uh, uh, an abnormal response to the air injection. So in such cases, maybe a manual near decimates dissection would give you better results. Uh, the other thing that we have seen is that instead of a single air injection, when you inject air, as the bubble forms, there is a rise in intraocular pressure. And also there is resistance to the bubble expansion. If you continue to inject more air to expand the bubble, it can go beyond the bursting pressure and it can rupture. As you see in this surgical video, that we are uh, injecting air and then you have a spontaneous rupture. So to overcome this, once you initiate the bubble, you can then do a paracentesis to release aqueous and lower the intraocular pressure. So thereby the counter pressure to the expansion of bubble is lowered. And then you can expand the bubble uh, to the desired size by uh, avoiding any spontaneous rupture. The outcome is usually good because you have a healthy functioning endothelium and uh, the corneas clear up pretty fast. And a lot of these patients uh, achieve uh, visual acuity, which is pretty close to what you achieve with the full thickness penetrating keratoplasty graft. Using femtosecond laser, you have the advantage of creating shaped incision, either zigzag, mushroom, or angulated cut. It gives you better apposition and maybe a stronger graft close junction. And all it, with the help of femtosecond laser, you can even create tracks going close to the decimus membrane and you can inject uh, air to, with, with a greater accuracy of achieving the big bubble. So here, this is the case where the femtosecond laser has been used to make the cut. You can see this is a mushroom cut uh, with the eye with, where there is intacts as well. So you remove the intacts. You can go at the base of the trifine, the, the femto cut, and you can inject air to initiate the bubble. You just, you have to be careful that when you are cutting out the residual stroma, you have to keep track of where the posterior cut is and you don't damage that. You prepare the donor in a similar way and you can see that you have a very nice opposition. Post-operatively, when you see the, the opposition is quite good and while the sutures are in, the astigmatism is pretty low, but even in eyes where you have done a femtosecond laser-assisted dark, once the sutures are out, these eyes are even prone to unpredictable astigmatism. A use of intraoperative OCT can help you uh, uh, find the plane where you are injecting the air. So you can use that to initiate the track and see. So that's useful. And it's also quite useful when you are doing a manual dial. Recently, Masuma Busin has described uh, the intraop OCT even to detect the presence of a type 1 big bubble. If you have a scar like this in case where there is a scar involving the all the layers post hydrox, you can do a manual uh, near decimates uh, dissection. This is pretty much similar to like what I was showing earlier, that you do a nice deep trephination, do a debulking first using the stromal dissector. I make a paras paracentesis, put an air bubble to make the eye a bit softer, make a peripheral groove, which goes about 90% depth, and then use the pocket forceps to create the channel along the trephination mark. And then you can uh, cut the stroma at the edge of the trephination. And then you use what is like a modified Marlbrand's peeling technique where your left hand, you're trying to peel the residual stroma. The right hand, the dissector is basically helping you break the stromal fibers as they are separating. Using this technique, you maintain a uniform plane and you find that uh, this is uh, you, the residual stroma that you leave behind is quite minimal. And you can achieve an outcome which are quite comparable to the techniques which bear the pre-decimates layer. So you can see here that we have been able to achieve a very uniform plane, quite deep. And that's the two instruments that are designed available from stores. And that's what the post-op appearance, you can see that the residual stroma in this case is fairly minimal. You can hardly make out and it's quite uniform. Bed. 
combined procedures in very advanced cases, sometimes in, like in this case of a keratoglobus with prior hydrops in the center when we were dissecting. As we came to the central part, we ended up creating a central perforation, which was fairly large. So to overcome this, what we did was we created a central six millimeter opening. We used another donor tissue to create a DSEC lenticule, which measuring six millimeter in diameter, placed that over the perforation, then placed a large corneous pleural ring devoid of the SMS membrane, secured it in position, and then put an air bubble to hold the donor lenticule in place and close the conjunctiva over, over this. And this is what you find in the early post-operative period. You see that the cornea looks pretty clear. And this patient did very well, achieving a visual acuity of about 2040 with good endothelial cell count. Uh, it can be combined with surface reconstruction. Like this is a case where we did a DAL combined with limbal autograft, and they did very well with unilateral chemical injury. This is a patient with post-chemical injury where a DALC was performed. He ended up having a severe lipid keratopathy in the interface. So we went back to do a repeat DALC. So it, these, these are procedures that can be repeated. So we did refination and we then uh, went back into the same plane what we had done earlier uh, and did a deeper dissection. And at the end, we punched out a donor tissue, placed it in a position. Then from the fellow eye, we took a limbal biopsy, a small uh, one clock eye, and did, we did the simple limbal epithelial transplantation, dividing into small bits and using fibrin glue to position on the surface. And we placed a bandage contact lens on top. So this was the post-operative outcome. At six months, you can see the graft uh, is maintained very, uh, it's a clear graft and the epithelial phenotype is maintained and his visual acuity came back to about 2030. Complications, again, uh, Professor Sarnikula will be dealing with. I won't go in detail. You can have perforation and double anterior chamber, which are usually managed by using air or a gas tamponade. We have to avoid getting a, a pupillary block or urethra zavalier syndrome. Stromal rejections can occur and varying incidence from 4 to 24%. If you have prior allergic eye disease or if you have vascularization, you can have greater risk of that. They respond quite well to topical steroid. We tend to use topical tacrolimus ointment as a long-term usage in these eyes and to avoid using a lot of steroid. We recently published uh, the outcomes of using gamma irradiated lenticules for keratoplasty. So these are acellular tissue with a shelf life of two years at room temperature. And these can be used for uh, doing a uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty with good outcomes. And the tissue, if you see, this is the donor tissue, uh, which is an albumin storage medium. It behaves pretty much like a normal cornea. You can just, uh, the cornea is clear rim, you can see, you can punch it out and you can place it on the eye and you can achieve a good outcome. So basically in conclusion, various anterior lamellar keratoplasty techniques should be considered as procedure of choice for corneal diseases with healthy endothelium. The surgical techniques continue to evolve, ensuring better visual outcome, better refractive outcome. The pre-op evaluation and surgical planning is essential to minimize complications. You cannot use the same technique for all your cases. And currently, the femtosecond laser technology, which a lot of them have integrated anterior segment OCT as well, as well as the intraoperative microscope integrated OCT, they are likely to play a major role in future anterior lamellar keratoblasts. Thank you. Thank you for a patient view. Thank you very much, Dr. Rajesh, for the impressive uh, presentation. And now we are moving to the presentation of Dr. Sharif Hosni. Good evening. I'm Dr. Sharif Hosni, a cornea surgeon at Watani Hospital. Uh, at first, I'd like to thank all our esteemed colleagues who joined us in this meeting today. I'd like to present the uh, Dr. Fugla had uh, passed through uh, some of the objects through it, but like to stress on some points on how I face my complications in deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Let's start by intraoperative complications like air bubble problems. So I'd like to start my video here. Sometimes some tissues resist the air bubble injection and you can uh, do an injection once, twice, and thrice, and it always fails. You never reach the appropriate plane Usually, I use, uh, I don't use a blunt needle. I use a regular needle using and directing the blunt tip downwards and the sharp tip forwards or anteriorly. And it helps me to penetrate through the uh, depths of the tissue I'd like to go through. I did three trials for injecting the air bubble, and every time I got only surgical emphysema and uh, the air fluid, uh, the air escapes to a certain level that I don't want to go. Actually, I never lose hope and I start trying a different site 
and a different depths of tissue to implant the air bubble. Uh, I would like to go as deep as possible and the air bubbles actually give me a mark where to go. Whenever I have such emphysematous tissue, it gives you an anatomical landmark where to go with your needle. You usually go below it. Now, finally, uh, I have a big bubble formation. I tested by pressing the intraocular pressure and I complete my technique as it is. I always uh, uh, go through the edges to be sure that is completely separated. Another problem is the incomplete separation. Uh, actually, this is a tedious process and you have to go through manual dissection up to the periphery of the lamellar interface using a blunt spatula. It takes some time, but you are always trapped and you can never do except this. Manual dissection is the only procedure to go through dissecting the residual tissue which has not been separated by air bubble. The third problem is failed air, bubble, uh, failed air bubble formation. Not every time, especially in compact tissue and tissue with uh, dystrophies, it never separates and you are never always able to form a bubble. So you have to keep your last resort for manual dissection. I always keep my last resort for manual dissection uh, for the cratopla for the uh, tissue, and I call it near full thickness desmet separation. I go a layer by layer using a regular uh, knife. It's breathtaking, but usually I succeed to reach the level I want and I will leave about 50 to 100 micron of stromal tissue. And this is suffice for me uh, to do a lamellar graft and the residual tissue are never uh, a problem. Residual uh, stromal tissue is never a problem and always goes clear with time. Actually, this, uh, this uh, tissue was uh, doing a fem to lamellar cut, and I'm looking for the desmet layer here to separate, and I'm trying to do a DMEC graft. It's a different technique, but this is how I try with it in such a tissue. I'm going to uh, suture the tissue in the regular way, and I'm trying to fit the axis of the graft. I usually put the graft as it is. I have a landmark of the transfer for transverse palpebral fissure. I try always to put it in the lower half of the cornea to be sure that I'm going to have the astigmatism with the rule. Let's go for uh, desmet problems. Puncture of desmet membrane. Puncture of desmet membrane may be a catastrophe, especially if the central or near central, and uh, you have to be very uh, cautious with dealing with it. It's never a turning point. You can always continue doing a lamellar graft. Don't try to play a lot with the knife. Uh, the only way uh, to check if you can continue or not is injecting an air bubble in the AC. And you have to look and check, are you going to succeed to maintain the AC with the air bubble or not? If it succeeds to maintain the air bubble in it, it means that we have a good surface tension to work on. The second step would be finding the uh, interface, the interface of uh, separation. Uh, we already have an interface of separation and I managed to use it with, uh, to find it with uh, such forceps uh, by fetching which layer I go through. Whenever I feel that I reach it, the easily separatable layer and the forceps moves freely through it, I start cutting it and I'm going to expose uh, the stromal, the, uh, the desmet membrane. So uh, the message is never try to convert whenever you have a cut. You have different techniques and different technicalities to go through uh, the tissue and complete as a lamellar process. I always, I always check the edges of the gra of the separation of the tissue, especially in type one, to be sure that you have completely separated everything. Another problem is whenever you go and cut, sorry for the bad quality of this uh, photo, uh, but uh, whenever you have a full thickness cut, a full thickness cut usually in the past allowed me to convert to be a picky, picky pee, penetrating one, but now I go to uh, a trial with it first. This is desmet break, which is another problem which has been previously found in the tissue or I created it with a needle. Let's go for femto cut problems. The most problem, the, the most big problem I face whenever I do femtocuts is centration. 
whenever you put the clamp of the machine on the cornea, it flattens it, and you are never sure where is the center, where is the edge. Uh, so uh, I always uh, uh, mention that you have to first mark where is the cuts, the center, the four edges. Uh, so as when you aplanate the surface, everything in anatomy is going to change. As you see, everything is flattened, but I have the marks denoting where I am going to cut, and then I have measured it previously. This allows me to never fail with decentration of cuts with femto laser machines. It goes smooth. And exactly in place. Lamellar cuts. I always faced with deep lamellar cuts a problem. Whenever you use the femto machine to cut a deep lamellar tissue, uh, you face a problem that uh, you're going to create intrastromal folds because the tissue never cuts uniformly. It never cuts in a straight or a curved manner. It cuts in a straight way. So uh, whenever you apply the femto lamellar cut in a certain tissue, you might end with such a picture with full thickness major lamellar folds in the tissue, which is very difficult to uh, manipulate. The, let's go for the post-operative complications and desmet detachment. This is a person or a patient which has suffered from desmet detachment a few days after the operation. Uh, you can't see anything in the AC, uh, but I always try injecting an air bubble under topical anesthesia, and this procedure usually uh, succeeds. Whether you use SF6 or an air bubble, it depends on the surgeon. This is how it looks like after it has been manipulated. About rejected lamellar grafts. Rejected lamellar grafts, as Dr. Fogla has mentioned, might vary between 4% to 24%, but appears, but it's very easy to manage and, uh, and treat. Uh, separation of the tissue is very easy. The lamellar graft can be just removed from place with a piece of uh, Sinski, with a piece of uh, forceps, and you just remove it easily, uh, the piece of butter, and then you start preparing another piece of graft and doing another lamellar one. So lamellar cuts are very easy to treat. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching me. I hope this would be uh, something uh, cheerful for you tonight. Thank you. Now we're going to present Dr. Vincenzo San Nicola. Uh, he is the guru of Italy regarding the uh, uh, lamellar cornea surgery, especially the anterior lamellar. Uh, welcome, Dr. San Nicola. Hello. How are you? I am okay. I just had uh, risotto with mushroom. <laughs> Very good. And let me say hello to hello, all of you. Good morning. My talk My today friend, is uh, tips uh, and tricks to uh, Mark and uh, a lot of friends that probably are connected. I want to show you uh, my talk tonight, starting from uh, some uh, uh, Usually the people, when they speak about dark, they think that they are speaking about big bubble. Uh, this is absolutely not correct because there are many dark surgical techniques. Uh, if Sorry, you... Dr. Sir, Nicola, for interruption. Would you please put it on uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation, the, the icon which is on the, yeah, the, yes. Okay. Yes. Perfect. This way? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So the there are many techniques in the literature, right? Summarize it in this uh, a small uh, numbers of techniques because I believe that these are the most important technique as uh, spinning off. That is a Bubble. great technique. Uh, because, technique. Uh, I like to use uh, this. Uh, was not the first technique. I like probably this technique. It's a feeling of I technique cannot describe bubble. from bulb. Huh? Uh, the first in, uh, technique uh, of bubble the... failure. And it's a still a very good procedure because okay. you're really okay. stripping the stroma. One second, there is some voice. Okay. 
Okay. If you um, look if, if you go at the, OCT, uh, the post of uh, uh, OCT, we can find uh, the best than when we uh, perform a peeling off technique, every time we have uh, a residual bed that is less than 30 micron. Post of OCT. Uh, so the when, Sujita technique with the hydro dissection is a still a very good procedure to do a dark. It's a manual dark, it's not a big bubble, but it's very uh, comfortable because you can go very deep and really make a safe procedure. It's a still a very good to uh, Bosa. It's a device that conquire technique is the most popular manual technique. And uh, I'm still using this technique when. This uh, Sorry, you cannot change my slide. Otherwise, Shed I strong. cannot talk. Puoi togliere il tono a tutto il video? Non si vede, vai. Non so cosa sia. Io sto già avanti. So, viscoelastic. Trying to dissect the decimate from the screen. Okay. Uh, big bubble, but sorry. This is the slide. I'm a bit scared. Let's just start the audio. Are you hearing my? Uh, Audio as well? Yeah, yeah, everyone is enjoying your presentation very much. Okay. So uh, the uh, disco section with Melis technique good. is a very good technique as well. And you can really go deep as a big bubble. But needle, big bubble, this section yeah. is absolutely the most, the most popular, popular technique, uh, technique as Raish. You can see the video before you almost uh, said everything. Bubble. Uh, uh, we have many yeah. is the most popular we have many technique, uh, in the world. technique about the bubble video using needle or, or canva but, but sometimes uh, you can we have should uh, always remember that, that we can have a big two. bubble type two that is the, the bubble the, the starts from bubble the bubble because you can to the break everything. In this case, you really have an air bubble, bubble that cleaved off. Oh. So the, a big it's advance, I believe, was the canola big bubble. I, I as part of the, the special previous canola. speaker. He was you speaking can, about uh, 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 using needles every time. There are other canola and, uh, on the market. Uh, from Tan, making from many Cobra, times in many other canolas recently as well. Uh, with canola, with canola you have we very can really good, uh, go deep in surgery. You can see uh, here, obtain a very after good definition, power. with spatula, you go deeper and deeper until you feel in your fingers that you are deep enough because the Spatula moves uh, much better, and yes. you can have a very beautiful big bubble. As with the cannula big bubble, you can have a better result. There is this paper. So in this shows paper, the we found comparing the, uh, uh, 266 uh, comparing big bubble needle with down needle with the 241 cannula down. We had the can better see result with cannula can than the needle. Uh, and we had uh, 94% of uh, uh, decimated talc percent of cases. And the number of rapture, rapture as well rapture is less. But let's move to the standard technique. Gives better results because you can really go deeper and deeper and uh, more frequently obtain uh, a bubble. I like to do cannula big bubble as Another first approach. Another interesting trick in your surgery when we do is when you are in trouble, 
and you don't know if you really if we don't know if bubble. we get bubble we can put Donald a nice bubble in the interior chamber put a small bubble area in the interior chamber and, and then you can uh, see that uh, we can the see that we really the got the bubble if because the air remains in periphery in the schema you can see and that the schema the small shows very bubble well has that to the remain in the periphery the bubble in the interior chamber the cannot bubble. go in the center because the big bubble Let's see now the original, so the original technique Amber described technique. by Amber. He suggested to open, this knife the, to open to the, open the bubble. bubble with this. Uh, but we knife. believe that it's, I believe really, it's really dangerous very. This maneuver. So we so move, we to, move to, to this, this other technique. technique. Putting some visco. We got the idea the from Mark Terry and using a, a visco elastic uh, on the bubble uh, to go what? inside. Which is our and you can goal. See that, uh, we want to go inside to the bubble. We can go inside to the bubble the without losing the and air of the bubble. The knife using the cadre to knife. Top. Professor Nicola, can you stop the, the narration? Sorry? Air or only small yes. bubbles. Please keep this. Then slideshow. I'm sorry? Slideshow. Slideshow button. Escape. Please escape. Tied to the bubble, push some visco, and progressively exchange the visco with air until we have. Uh, we are trying to solve this problem because there's a voice inside. Probably you you are listening. Yes, yes. Just just this escape button. I'm sorry. From the keyboard. Escape escape button. Escape button. I have a technician here helping me. Position now. Then slideshow. Yes. Uncheck the first box. The first box. No, 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 no. If you uncheck reproducing box. audio, if you uncheck reproducing comment audio. Yes, the first checkbox. In the middle, in the top middle of the screen, under revisioni, under revisioni, there is a box that says reproducing comment audio. If you uncheck that box, then you won't have the audio in the slides. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now much better. Final. Thank you, sir. So let's move to the opening bubble that I believe that is very interesting because. Uh, the original amber technique is really dangerous, I believe. So we move it to this technique using a visco on the bubble and use a cataract knife. In this way, if we move the knife from bottom to top, you can see that uh, the needle, I'm sorry, the knife goes inside to the bubble. You can lose a, a small, some bubble is, but the big bubble remain there. And in this way, you can go inside to the bubble and exchange the air with the visco elastic, like I want to do because I believe that the maneuvers are much more safe. And this is the scissors that you can use to remove the stroma. And look, I went inside, I didn't lose any air and now I can, uh, in, um, I can put visco inside of the bubble and the opening and removing the stroma is much safer. So what can I do if uh, big bubble fail? This is another interesting problem. You saw the uh, previous surgeon, he said, try again, hey, uh, I, prefer to move uh, to visco dissection when uh, uh, the big bubble failed. And uh, as you see, can see here, if you go in the periphery and with the spatula, you try to find a deeper tunnel, you can try visco dissection 
and you can have a, a very good uh, visco bubble and you can see that the air in anterior chamber goes in the periphery. That means that you got a bubble, a bubble full of visco. So this is, I believe, the best rescue technique when a big bubble fails. But anyway, even try again air is a good uh, approach. Uh, there is a paper that was written from an American group that shows that there are some addition between uh, uh, the deepest plane and stroma that can be separated from the visco and not by the air, because the density of the viscoelastic can be better to dissect the stroma. Uh, I would like to move now to the uh, complication that is the other paper. The sculptural award. Where is it? Aspetta, io volevo il suono. No, qua non c'è nessuno. Ok, vai. So, I already spoke many times about uh, uh, the, the fact that we can fix all the ruptures during uh, dark surgery. And this is uh, uh, our previous paper speaking about DDALC and PDDALC. That means uh, that DDALC is uh, the, uh, procedure, the procedures that you can obtain with the big bubble or with visco dissection. PDDALC is the procedures that you can obtain with the manual dissection. But we are not using anymore this terminology and these acronyms. And you can find the description in this paper. And now we are using DALC for the original DALC technique, manual dissection, layer by layer, hydro dissection. But we are using a subtotal interior lamellar keratoplasty to indicate big bubble type one, visco dissection, and the air visco bubble because it's not a deep interior lamella keratoplasty, but it's a subtotal removing of the stroma. Almost the, all the stroma is removed. And TALC, total interior lamella keratoplasty, is the acronym from the bubble type two. Uh, we review uh, the rupture rate in the literature and PK conversion rate that goes from zero to 60%. Well, let me say that we are not converting anymore during a rupture in adult procedures. We already presented uh, this experience in uh, uh, World Cornea Cornea, World Cornea Cornea, World Cornea Congress in San Diego in 2015. And now we are going to presenting the, our technique in a paper that will be published soon. You can find all this data even in the cornea book and all the videos. Well, uh, uh, we, uh, we performed a large study of more than 1,000 DALC, and we found 91 ruptures. 75 ruptures, that was 82.4%, re, uh, was repaired at the first day post-op. Uh, in the 16 cases, developed a double anterior chamber. So in 10 cases, it was enough to do a single rebubbling and take care about head position. And all these 10 cases resulted to fix it. In other three cases, uh, it was necessary to rebubbling and suture replacement because the such sutures, especially if you have a, a, a running suture, can have a different compression of the recipient bed that can make the ruptures open. So I strongly suggest you, especially if you have a rupture, to use a single stitch. Because if you have a, a, the, in the first day post-op a different compression of one stitch, you can remove and put again. If you have a running suture, you have to make a new suture of all the transplant. So in other three cases, it was important to take care about the disparity of curvature between donor and recipient. Anyway, the type of ruptures 
uh, you can see that are much more uh, frequent in dark than in talc and stalk because in talc you are trying to go deeper and deeper and in this maneuver you can break the recipient bed but the macro ruptures are much more common in talc and stalk i remember that talc and stalk is a big bubble type one or two and the micro ruptures are much more frequent in uh, uh, dark than in talc and stalk anyway i want to speak about the management of three type of ruptures that can that you can have in a big bubble procedures or in dark or in visco dissection that is completely different because you have to consider everything to uh, win your war uh, this is a regular ruptures that the most common ruptures that can happen when you are trying to cut the stroma in the periphery you can uh, touch a little bit uh, the, the, the recipient bed and it's easy to break it to have ruptures. So the rules are complete the stromectomy, put the stitch and air in anterior chamber and move the air in order to remove all the fluid. And, uh, and at the, a good head position regarding the site of ruptures, it's necessary because the eye has to tamponate the rupture exactly as the retinal surgeon does. Uh, another terrible rupture is the excessive trephination because you won't do a dark, but you made a, a trephination a little bit uh, uh, deeper and you can perforate. What can we do here? Absolutely, you don't have to convert, just put some stitches and close the rupture and make a manual dalk. In this way, you can remove all the stroma. And as you can see, I don't remove the stitch. I first fix the donor. And only at the end, when all the donor is almost fixed, you can remove the residual stroma and put the last stitch, some in the anterior chamber, and all, even these ruptures can be fixed. But the most important problem is when you have to fix a rupture and you have a disparity in a manual duct between donor and recipient. For example, in a keratoglobus or in a, a terrible infection with the flatter uh, donor than recipient. Uh, I want to show you this uh, schema that you can follow better me. This is a keratoglobus. And uh, if you do manual dark, it's the best procedures because as uh, even Raish showed, you can have a very good result. But uh, as you can see here, you see, this is the first eye and we manage it with many stitches and the results looks great. But look what happened in the second eye. Here, we perforate. And here we try to go in this other part and perforate again because too thin in this, in this side. How can we manage these ruptures is uh, very important because we have to consider that because the disparity, if you have a rupture, when you put the donor that uh, it's uh, much more uh, uh, steeper than the recipient, and you fix the donor, you can have some folds and your ruptures can remain open and you can uh, develop an untreatable double chamber. So in this case, I suggest you to cut the recipient bed 360 degree full thickness cut. Uh, what we want, we want to create a new uh, donor that is a combination between dark donor and self endothelium. Because we cut the endothelium as a, a, the sac graft and we combine it, the self endothelium with the, the allograft dark. This is the schema and this is the surgery. So we went with the scissors and we cut the older recipient bed and we saved this. Uh, uh, endothelium 
And then we completed our surgery as a PK, removing all the endothelium. And uh, now we are combining the self-endothelium with dark allograft, and this is the new graft. And the results were very good one day post-op, 40 days post-op. And you see this terrible keratoglobus was fixed. Um, even if we got a, a rupture during the surgery. Uh, a, an opposite uh, a problem is with the uh, uh, recipient uh, that is uh, flatter than donor. As for example, this is the schema. You see that the recipient bed is flatter than donor that is steeper. For example, in this terrible case, we treated the disease infection with the uh, systemic antiviral and local steroids. After five months, the, the pattern resulted uh, much better. And uh, we decide surgery, which surgery? Only DALC we can do in these cases. Any PK will fail, a large stromectomy and layer by layer delamination. But during surgery that uh, uh, we, we, we did a large, large trephination, when we were finishing our surgery, we perforate. Well, we put it donor, and uh, after nine days, uh, it developed this terrible double chamber because the recipient bed is flatter. There is no air that can move the flatter recipient to the uh, steeper donor because the anatomy is against this combination. It's uh, without any utilities to put air in anterior chamber, even we, if we put a very big bubble in anterior chamber, you cannot fix the disparity. And if you do not speak the disparity, you cannot fix the double chamber. So you have to cut the recipient bed because cutting the recipient bed, you can relax the tissue and finally, the recipient bed can be reattached to the donor, as you can see here in the schema. If you cut the recipient bed, putting air, finally, the recipient bed can be attached to the donor. And here is the surgery. So we removed some stitches, and then with the knife, started our cart, and then with the scissors, we cut it all the recipient bed, just a small tongue at uh, six hours remaining, not cut it. And this is the post op. This is a one year follow up. So we started from this case, and then after one year, we fixed the design for this young guy. Uh, and the last complication that I had terrible, and then I finished if I Two minutes more. I was at the Russian National Congress in nine, uh, 19, two years ago, and uh, my uh, talk was uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty with live surgery. And uh, uh, my lecture was dark, old ruptures can be fixed after my surgery. So during surgery, you cannot imagine what happened. A complication I never had in my life. Uh, and considering that my talk was uh, all the ruptures can be fixed, I was becoming crazy. So as, as you can see, I insufflated the air in the stroma, but I don't see anything of strange. So I thought to have a big bubble, but as you can see now in the soccer game, you can go to the VAR and see what really happened during your surgery. And let's see what happened. If you can see the air is going here, but here we got a small big bubble in the periphery that I didn't care during the insufflation. So let's go over. So I, I tried the visco dissection and look what happened. The visco dissection popped in anterior chamber. So now I am really in trouble. 
because I have a visco bubble, visco in anterior chamber. I never had this complication, but this explosion made me crazy. And because my talk was uh, all the ruptures can be fixed, I continued my surgery in this way. And you see here, fluid from anterior chambers come out. Anyway, keep calm and go. Because even if your talk is old rupture can be fixed, you have to fix old ruptures. It's important that you remain uh, with the uh, um, open mind and try to fix the rupture. And look what I did in this case. I removed the stroma. And anyway, as you see here, so you are, we are very deep. And there is air here, Deschmidt membrane ruptures, the yellow, and visco in anterior chamber. Well, this is a good, uh, uh, this is good anyway. I sutured the donor and uh, they awarded me any time the day after. And here is the post-op, one day post-op. Uh, they send me the uh, pictures from Russia. And you can see that uh, down there is some visco in the stroma here. I don't know if you can see my indicator. And uh, here I have another similar case with the visco that uh, uh, I was trying to remove and I perforate. Well, even in this case, you can uh, remove all the stroma and put the donor and look what happened. This is one day post-op, some visco is here. This is four day post-op, and here three days post-op. And after one month, the visco is not there anymore. And this is the result. Uh, the conclusion is that all the ruptures can be fixed. Healthy endothelium should never be replaced. And dark is not a good choice for stromal disease, but it's the gold standard today. Sorry for the uh, beginning of my talk with two voice. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't, I do not like so much the computer. I really uh, am praying that we can go back to real meeting when we can stay together, talk, watching uh, in our eyes and have a good wine and uh, good food together. Thank you, Yasin, for this. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. San Nicola. Uh, this was a wonderful presentation. And uh, as you see, there are uh, kind of like 224 uh, attendants in the meeting, so which is kind of like bigger than uh, a coordinated instruction course. And the presentation was elegant as everything in Italy. Viva Italia. Now we're going to go through uh, uh, a star who came from uh, the Gerrit Mellis uh, group. And now she's having her private business in Germany uh, and she's starting to be a guru. And she's going to present today Bowman's layer transplantation and advanced keratoplasty. Hi, Lamis Baidun from uh, Germany. Hello, Hazem. Masal khair, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I'm very uh, honored that you invited me to speak on the two topics I actually did at the NEOS in Rotterdam with Gerrit Mellis. So um, I will share my screen first. Do you see my presentation? Not yet. Oh. One second. Share the screen. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Now now, okay, perfect. perfect. Okay, again, Masal Khair, everyone. Thank you, Hazem. You're always so kind to me. Thanks a lot. And I, I'm a, actually a consultant and surgeon at the University Hospital in Münster and at the ELSA Institute currently but I'm still involved with research with, with Rotterdam. And today I'm gonna to show you some work I've done in the last eight years. So this first talk is on Bowman layer transplantation for advanced keratoconus. 
and these are my disclosures. You all know that there are certain types of treatment for corneal, uh, for keratoconus, which start with mild keratoconus, moderate keratoconus, and advanced keratoconus. And we are lucky that scleral lenses have evolved in the past years and have made our treatment and visual rehabilitation of these patients much, much better. But still there are patients that are progressing, unfortunately. And for these cases, we all know that there is um, UV cross-linking and we have intrastromal ring segments. And if cases progress, we actually perform a corneal transplant. Um, but still there are cases which are having a too thin cornea where you cannot perform a UV cross-linking. So corneas that are below uh, 400 microns. And I wanna remind you that this technique has been developed in a time where we did not swell the cornea to do uh, corneal cross-linking. So therefore you see um, that the Mellis group at that time thought of the, of the solution for these eyes that are too thin, too steep, um, but still have a good visual outcome with, um, with scleral lenses and you don't want them to progress to do a penetrating transplant. So this is the group now I'm talking about. And even though we have actually nice and, and safer outcomes with penetrating keratoplasty or DALK for patients with, with, corn, with keratoconus, um, we still have uh, problems. And you've seen earlier in the talks, you've seen fantastic surgeries, but you also have complications. And some of those post-operative complications can be suture related and wound uh, healing problems. And these young patients that often have ocular surface problems due to atopic diseases, they are phagic, they are young, you don't actually want to transplant them several times in life. So therefore we um, thought of this technique that is for eyes with thin corneas, steep corneas that have a good visual outcome with a scleral lens, but you wanna halt progression in a way to preserve this outcome and start a safer treatment option and postpone keratoplasty. So we all know that Bowman's layer seems to play a role in the pathogenesis of keratoconus. And uh, one of the thought in this case was why not transplanting a Bowman's layer into the, um, into the stromal pocket. So um, this was the publication from 210 already. So in a time when um, UV cross-linking was already quite uh, advanced, but there were still some limitations. And here you see um, the schematic uh, cornea. And this is what we do for PK. And this is what we would do for DALK. And I wanna show you the isolated Bowman, la Bowman layer transplantation. You see the preparation of this um, Bowman layer. I will just have a video for you. you. So you have to mark it, you have to push the edge, you grab the Bowman's layer and pull it. And then it forms actually a roll quite nicely, just like the DMAC graft does. And then you put it into organ culture until transplantation. So now I would like to share with you a video on the preparation because you need to have the graft before you can do the surgery. Um, in Rotterdam, we have a very talented eye banker called Esther Grunewald, and she is uh, actually doing those preparations all the time. So very important at the beginning, you have to mark the interface. You first abrade the corneal epithelium, and then with a needle, you try to mark the interface. Actually, when you see a line, you are almost too deep already because it's most difficult to find the interface between the uh, Bowman's layer and the stroma, the anterior stroma, it's much more difficult than when preparing, for instance, a DMAC graft, where you can easily find the interface between um, the decimate and the stroma, the posterior stroma. So again, uh, you take your forceps and you try to pull at the at the Bowman's layer and um, this you have to do really carefully. And even though we know that Bowman's layer actually is a very um, a tight and stiff material because it also keeps our cornea in the, in the position and in the, in the shape we have, you can easily can tear this tissue. So therefore you have to do that 360 degrees around quite uh, carefully. We try to 
take a large Bowman's transplant. I will show you later in the video for the surgery why that is. And um, as you see here, it's actually also taking much longer than when performing a DMAC graft preparation. So here you pull and pull, and I will move it a little bit further. You see now we're coming to the last parts. And in the end, you pull off the whole piece and put it then into alcohol to remove all the epithelial cells. And then you put it into organ culture. Here you see the surgical technique. So you have your transplant now. And uh, so now you can move forward and uh, here are the steps. You do a scleral tunnel, you do the dissection. You just heard about the Mellis dog technique. And actually this is a modified technique where you use the Mellis dog technique, but um, uh, do the, do the uh, dissection more uh, centrally. And then you implant, unroll and final position. I will now show you the video of this surgery. So here you um, do the scleral tunnel and try to drip and not let any blood go into the interface. Then you do a paracentesis to enter air into the anterior chamber. This is the main um, helpful thing for the, for the dulk preparation of, of the Mellis technique. Here you see the spatulas we use for the dulk technique. And first you find the level where you want and we aim at the midstromal area then you take the second spatula to dissect the superior part very carefully. Often you have in these progressed and advanced keratoconus, you have scars. So you have to be very careful and try to dissect in a way that you don't cause a rupture. And then you take the second, the third spatula actually, and then dissect the entire 360 degrees cornea. After that, you have to, of course, release a little bit air from the anterior chamber because you now you want to in, uh, insert the transplant. So you need some space and you leave a little air bubble because you remember these eyes are phagic eyes and you want to keep some secure the area to not touch the lens. And here you enter a, a glide into the anterior chamber. In the meantime, you clean the graft again from the organ culture, you stain it with tripe and blue. And we insert the graft actually in a way uh, different than for DMAC, you do it this way with the, with the bubble, with the um, folds uh, towards you, facing towards you while in, in this Bowman transplant, you have to put it down as the shape of the cornea is. So the graft rolls this way. So you carefully insert the graft and this surgery needs a lot of patience because now you have to unfold this, this graft. You use BSS and you use your cannula. And now this is what I told you, we try to take a large graft because what we try to do is to really push the graft into the peripheral uh, area of this pocket. And by this, we think we are um, uh, achieving the, the flattening of the cornea because of the wound healing and the stretching of the graft into the periphery. So this is our hypothesis. We have no proof for this, but we actually found that these eyes are showing a flattening of about seven diopters. And these eyes um, show some kind of improvement of spectacle corrected visual acuity. We think it is because of this contact lens corrected visual acuity stays the same. And therefore it's important that you inform your patient that visual outcome is not better after the surgery. It's just sustained and you wanna, you wanna um, avoid that a further progression of this eye occurs and you have to do a transplant later on. So here you see the last steps, how you unfold the graft and this is then the final position of the Bowman layer transplant. Here you see post-operative um, OCT pictures with a thin fine line of this, which you see here in white. Here again, the arrows are indicating the Bowman's transplant and here you see the flattening pre-op, post-op and the difference map. So 
in summary, the benefits of bone layer transplantation are that you are not compromising the anterior and also not the posterior corneal surface. The patient doesn't have sutures, you shouldn't have any um, suture related problems. So this is a very big benefit. Here we have a patient with a dog on one eye and a bowman on the other eye. And actually he's happy with both, both visual outcomes, but the benefit he feels is with bowmans, the, the rehabilitation and the wound um, and wound healing was much better and he didn't feel that eye so much. The, the other advantage is that a Bowman layer is um, acellular and therefore we don't have any rejection. You are trying to postpone the um, a more invasive treatment with this surgery. And of course, since we are able to use one donor for both transplants, um, anterior and posterior, you can efficiently use this um, tissue. Thank you very much. Denise, thank you very much for this. Uh... Uh, very elegant presentation and for the novel idea. And uh, for the sake of time, we're going to move to the second part of uh, the session, which is the posterior lamellar keratoplasty state of art. And we're going to start with uh, Professor Dr. Tem Raga. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the, our esteemed uh, uh, guest speakers for their nice presentations. Uh, I'm going to share with you uh, now uh, my presentation about the ultra thin TSEC. Can you see my screen now? Not yet. Yeah, would you please put it in uh, presentation, slide presentation? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Okay. Perfect. I'm going to talk about why I like ultra thin TSEC in the endothelial uh, keratoplasty uh, technique. Uh, as we all know, endothelial keratoplasty is the standard of care for endothelial dysfunction. And these are the indications for endothelial uh, keratoplasty. Uh, number one, uh, Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, uh, uh, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, uh, phagic anterior chamber IOLs, especially the old designs of cache and the uh, Novita, uh, the angle supported ones, and for rejection after uh, PK. Uh, we have the types of the endothelial keratoplasty, the deep lamellar endothelial keratoplasty, which is now uh, more or less obsolete, except with the femtosecond laser, and the uh, distech, including the ultra thin one with, uh, uh, with the thin grafts uh, less than uh, 100 microns, which I'm going to talk about uh, today in details the uh, uh, predismatic endothelial keratoplasty and the DMAC or uh, dismiss membrane endothelial keratoplasty. But what about the uh, DSEC? DSEC increases the corneal thickness by adding stroma. This causes induction of hypropic shift and uh, there is an interface between stroma of the donor and the stroma of the recipient, which may cause haze and uh, scarring. So few patients can see 20-20 uh, vision. Uh, but the advantages of the ultra thin DSEC grafts over the DSEC grafts is that it is uh, thinner, so, so uh, better uh, uh, graft uh, attachment, less graft dislocation, uh, better final uh, outcome because uh, there is little haze uh, than the DSEC, uh, quicker visual rehabilitation, and uh, less rejection because of the less uh, uh, stroma uh, included. Why are we told to do DMAC? They are more physiological and more anatomical for sure. A quicker return of vision, a better outcome or better uh, final visual acuity, less rejection rate. We accept this, but are there limitations for DMAC? Yes. The technical difficulties in donor and preparation and insertion inside the recipient eye. I'm going to start with the harvesting of the graft in DMEC, which is less, less reproducible than uh, uh, ultra thin DSEC. It's a nerve wracking procedure, and the dismiss membrane may tear in about 10 to 50%. There is a tissue loss, and we must abort the procedure in this situation. And the donor must be older than 50 or even 60. This means that less endothelial count and less vital endothelium. Also, diabetes in the donor 
is not uh, uh, recommended in cases of DMEG because of the attachment of the uh, dismiss membrane to the stroma. Regarding the ultra thin sac, it's more reproducible because it's done with the microkeratome with donor in the artificial anterior chamber. So uh, the tissue loss is less uh, likely than DMEG. Uh, also, there is uh, no lower limit, limit for age. We can use younger grafts with higher uh, vital endothelial cells. Diabetes also is in donor is not an issue. So we have no headache of the, uh, uh, of the graft preparation if we are going to uh, uh, order a pre-cut uh, cornea. Regarding the, the MEC, uh, uh, deploying the graft into the eye, there is a problem in the orientation of the graft inside the injector. If there is uh, some sort of un abnormal fold, the graft will enter the anterior chamber uh, in abnormal position or in a, a bad position. Also, the graft can shoot uncontrollably into the eye and can enter partially in the, into the anterior chamber and requires additional maneuvers to be brought completely inside the anterior chamber. So we have many causes of endothelial cell loss during the preparation and during the injection and during the insertion in the uh, eye. Uh, and once the graft, uh, the graft inside is inside the eye, it's not easy to judge. Is it in the uh, correct uh, orientation, like in the left uh, side, or it's upside down completely, or the graft orientation sometimes may be uh, partially good and partially bad? like in the right side. And to judge the orientation, uh, we have to do more sophisticated uh, 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 tests to make sure about the orientation inside the anterior chamber. Unfolding the graft when it is in the anterior chamber, it's not that easy a procedure. We have many, many uh, maneuvers to uh, uh, unfold it inside the anterior chamber. We have tapping technique, we have uh, 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 Depena uh, technique, we have small bubble technique, we have a large bubble technique, we have spatula technique, repeated fluid injection, uh, 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 pinch and roll technique, uh, single sliding cannula maneuver, many techniques, and all uh, uh, every surgeon has its own technique, and we can use uh, a mixture of these techniques. But regarding uh, the graft orientation or insertion in the uh, ultra thin dissect, it's very, very reproducible, much easier to transfer from the donor cornea to the glide or injector. And in the insertion is more controlled with less likely to flip inside the anterior chamber. Uh, minimal maneuvers make this uh, insertion uh, easy and with much less chance for endothelial cell loss and can be done reliably even in the presence of corneal edema, which is not the case in case of DMAC. I'm going to show a short video uh, showing the uh, very simple steps of uh, uh, the ultra thin dissect uh, uh, procedure. After uh, uh, stripping of the dismiss membrane, the graft is now uh, taken in the uh, bosin glide, inserted easily in the anterior chamber in its uh, right position. And this is the end of the procedure to put uh, air uh, to uh, support or to make the graft fix it to the uh, recipient cornea. Minimal manipulations with less endothelial count. And after the end of the surgery, we can inject a full bubble of air to make sure that the graft is uh, attached to the recipient uh, cornea. So uh, we can inject air in DMEC, but it's not that easy because the DMEC separation uh, have a, 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 a it's very high instance. So we need to inject uh, expansile gas like uh, sulfur uh, hexafluoride, 20% instead of air. And this may cause a high intraocular pressure in the early post-operative period. We need more strict post-operative supine positioning of the patient for several hours or even days. And we need almost uh, daily monitoring for the uh, uh, cornea uh, to make sure that the graft is not uh, detached, and we may need OCT if we are unsure of this, and the need of the bubbling is very frequent. This is completely different from 
the uh, ultra thin sec which is not needed to uh, re-bubble uh, so frequent, and the air is fine, no need for expansion gas. The post-operative supine position is just a few hours with uh, intraocular pressure uh, issue is not uh, likely to increase in the first uh, few days because the air absorbs in only two to three days. Uh, so in general, it's much less of a headache. Uh, DMEC also cannot be done in every case because we have sometimes uh, a fakia with the corneal decompensation. We have sometimes large iris effects, uh, which uh, we can uh, have epithelomized eyes, and we have a deep anterior chamber in uh, myopic patients. Uh, all of these, and if even uh, previous glaucoma surgeries, all of these make uh, DMEC not possible or not suitable for this patient. We can do uh, ultra thin dissect in all these situations. Uh, regarding the visual acuity, we know that DMEC visual acuity is better than uh, DSEC, but it's not that much. In most, uh, most of the uh, literature, the difference is only one or two uh, letters, uh, but in these studies are comparing DMEC to the conventional DSEC. Now we have the thickness of DSEC or ultra thin DSEC uh, of 100 microns or even uh, down to 500 microns or, or nano thin uh, dissect, dissect, we can have visual acuity very, very close to uh, DMEC. Uh, to conclude, ultra thin dissect is less difficult than DMEC with no stress related to the stripping of the donor tissue, easier trans, uh, transfer of graft uh, to the eye with minimal manipulations after graft insertion, and can be performed uh, through an edematous cornea suitable for eyes with abnormal anatomy or significant comorbidities, a smoother post-operative course with less chance of re-intervention or re-bubbling, uh, gives visual results very close to DMEC without the technical pro uh, uh, difficulties and complexities of uh, DMEC, although the rejection rates are higher with ultra thin dissect compared to DMEC, this is balanced out by higher complication rate with uh, DMEC. I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tamer, for your nice presentation. And uh, we are uh, deeply sorry, uh, Mrs. Uh, Terry, because we're keeping uh, the godfather of posterior lamellar surgery here Saturday with us. But uh, no corneal uh, meeting can be done without the godfather of posterior lamellar corneal surgery. Here is uh, Mark Terry. Thank you very much, Dr. Mark, for sharing with us your presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'd like to share my screen here. Um, let me go back here. Let's see. Are you getting my, my screen uh, shared yet? Or Not no? yet. Okay. Let me, uh, I'll press my share screen. And uh, uh, How about now? Is that working now? Yeah. Perfect. Wonderful. Okay. Well, Hazem, uh, I'd like to thank you and also the organizing committee for allowing me to be here for this, uh, uh, this webinar. I wish it was in person, just like uh, Dr. Sarnicola. It is not as much fun, but at least we can get the information to you. So I'd like to give you some tips uh, for successful Demex surgery. Um, a lot of this is uh, assuming that you're already doing Demex surgery. Uh, these are my financial disclosures. I think the first thing to understand about DMEC surgery is that um, there's a geography to it. And the technique that we use, um, uh, we make uh, three incisions. We have a, a three millimeter or less main and wound. We have a paracentesocyte here and here, uh, as, which is one millimeter. We strip this area here, which 90% which of the time is eight millimeters. And the transplant we're putting in is um, 7.5 millimeters. So there's always a gap area um, of, between the stripped area and the tissue we're putting in. Most importantly, I think, understanding the geography is that the edge of your transplant should not overlap your paracentesis posterior openings or your main wound openings. You wanna make sure that that edge does not overlap because the edema from the posterior wound um, uh, will cause the edge of your graft to uh, go down in its, uh, uh, and, and lead to um, interface fluid. 
if you want to avoid uh, uh, have if you want to have success and you want to avoid complications, I highly recommend this wonderful website by um, uh, Dr. Peter Veldman, who's at the University of Chicago. It's called PatientReady.org. Uh, Just go to this website, and he will teach you about the confirmations to recognize the tissue takes a shape in the anterior chamber. And if you recognize those shapes, you will then learn how to open them if you go to this website. So I it's a free re website, I recommend it. Um, once you start doing Demec, you will see these shapes automatically and it becomes very, very easy to open them. The learning curve is much reduced when you uh, go through the, the standardized steps. Now I'm gonna go through some um, uh, surgical steps for you. Uh, in a short amount of time. I'm gonna talk about tight scrolls and tapping maneuvers, tight scrolls and using um, uh, Rajesh's uh, uh, Fogla cannula, dealing with upside down tissue, recentering the tissue once it's up in place and rebubbles at the slit lamp. Now this is a tissue from a 28 year old, so we can use very young tissue, but it is more tightly scrolled. If you can have the tissue in a double scroll conformation, that is makes it so much easier. We inject the tissue. When you inject the tissue into the eye, um, and to unscroll it, it's all about the chamber depth. It, if you can control the chamber depth, you can control and unscroll the tissue no matter how young it is. We inject the tissue, it's in a double scroll. The chamber is nearly flat. We tap down on the very center and that opens up the scroll slightly for us. Now it's important when you have a very tightly scrolled tissue to keep the chamber as shallow as possible, not flat, but at least very, very shallow. And also as you're tapping it open, open to keep the area that you have tapped open, keep that chamber shallow as well. Unlike um, a, a, a tissue that opens up very easily, um, keeping the chamber shallow everywhere on a very tight scroll is important. Now I'm gonna talk about the Fogla cannula. There's also the Sarnicola cannula and there's many other cannulas for doing this. Um, but basically when you have a tight scroll, you line up the tissue with your paracentesis site. And this cannula squirts out from the sides rather than from the tip. And it's important to give just a couple of little quick uh, squirts inside the, can inside the tissue. Then shallow the chamber, shallow the chamber, shallow the chamber. If you continue to try and open it with, by squirting in the interface, then what happens, the chamber deepens and the tissue will scroll up again and you'll be starting all over again. So the tip on this is just give a couple of squirts, shallow the chamber, and if you need to keep going in there to open it further like this, then you can get further squirts, but you do not want to have the chamber deepen at any time. Now, what if the tissue is upside down? I highly recommend that any tissue you use have a mark that identifies what is the decime side. We put an S mark or an F mark on the decime side to tell us which side is up. This is a, this is a video by one of my previous fellows, Dr. Phillips, uh, and Paul Phillips is unscrolling this tissue. It's a very easy unscrolling. He's very, very happy. And because it's going so well, he doesn't suspect that this tissue may be upside down. In fact, he doesn't recognize it until almost the very end. And what's happening is he's centering this tissue thinking it's wonderful. But if you look at this S right here, it's backwards and he's gonna notice it in just a second. Now, oh my gosh, it's upside down. If he hadn't had the S there, then he would not know it was upside down and he would probably put the air bubble. So now he knows that it's upside down. Now, what do you do? You go in, you shallow your chamber, you go in through a paracetamol and you irrigate along the iris surface. And you see that he's irrigating on the iris surface and this is flipping the tissue over. It's little tiny spurts. If the chamber becomes too deep, then you shallow it and then continue your spurts. What about centering? Now I'm giving you this video because this is an important video for me. I get questions about this all the time. Let's say you put the tissue up into position and when you put the air bubble, the air bubble pushes the tissue out of position. How do you center it again? Well, the first thing is you wanna try and center it on the first air bubble. So you wanna keep your eye in the primary gaze. Do not want your eye to rotate and then inject air bubble. And I'll show you what happens here. It'll shift your tissue over because the air bubble is going straight up. Your eye is rotated. It'll push the tissue to that side. Let me get my... Um... Okay, so watch this. I put the air bubble, the eye has gone out of primary gaze. And what's happened now is my tissue has shifted away from centration. It's shifted that way because the air bubble came straight up and the eye was torted that way. And so now the tissue has gone that. Now I'm gonna show you what not to do, what not to do. You do not wanna simply just 
just have this air bubble here after you've made it smaller and then sweep across. Because if you leave the center, the air bubble centered, the tissue is pinned at that location and it will not move. So all the sweeping across to try and move this tissue over will not work. You need to move the air bubble over toward the proximal side by rotating the eye in that direction and then sweeping. But if you sweep, sweep like this, it will do nothing. Let me show you that. So I'm gonna start sweeping. And I'll, I'll first I'll, I'll deepen the chamber, make the bubble smaller. Now watch the sweeping. It does nothing. It does nothing because the air bubble is right in the, holding the tissue there. So you do not want to just sweep from, from all the way across with an air bubble that pins the tissue there. It's very simple to rotate the eye in that direction or if it's under topical, have the patient look in that direction. And then the air bubble moves from here to over here or better yet, even over here. And when you sweep, you will move the tissue. So now I'm going to grasp the, um, uh, the sclera, rotate the eye in the direction I want the tissue to move. And now when I sweep, the air bubble is helping me and I can now have the tissue in centration. So how, do, how about rebubbling? It is mentioned that there are more rebubbles with Demec than there are with Desake. However, with Desake, you only rebubble when the tissue is floating in the anterior chamber. With Demec, you rebubble and the tissue is already up there, already in position. All you have to do is put air in the anterior chamber. You don't have to reposition it. You don't have to get the interface fluid out. All the things you have to do with the sake, you don't have to do with Demec. So how do you rebubble? You do it with the slit lamp. We used to do it with the patient lying down, but that's the worst way to do it because you don't have the depth perception. And also you can accidentally put the air bubble in the interface if you're not there. So at the slit lamp, you have perfect, you have perfect depth perception. We use a 43 inch IV extension tubing to remove, the, to separate the cannula from the, uh, from the syringe so you have better control of both. And when you have a 27 gauge cannula, not a needle, that we go through a previous paracentesis site. That's why we don't cover those paracentesis sites with our Demet graft. And it's a five cc syringe. So here's a um, video on how to do this. I'm attaching the, the 27 gauge cannula to one side and the five cc syringe of room air, not filtered. And I just put that to the other end of the IV tubing. This allows me to be able to hold the cannula very easily and comfortably at the slit lamp at, in the patient's eye. So here, the, here's my syringe. I can, I can manipulate both the microscope and the syringe at the same time. While with my other hand, resting on the patient's face, I can go in through the paracentesis, remove some fluid from the, um, from the anterior chamber by depressing the paracentesis, and then say one, two, three, and inject. Okay, so how was that having the eye rebubbled? Unbelievably easy no pain, and it was very quick. Great. The nice thing about, um, the nice thing about doing rebubbles of slit lamp is it does not interfere with your uh, flow of your clinic. It takes less time than taking out sutures. Um, and it's very comfortable for the patient. And it's very, very easy to do. And so I, I think that uh, we, should, we should all be doing our rebubbles at the slit lamp. Now, in summary then, if you recognize the various scroll conformations, and this becomes second nature to you after you've done a few of these, um, then you have a very quick operation. We've unfolded tissue within 10 seconds. We've unfolded tissue maximum, usually about seven or eight minutes. Patientready.com, I can't emphasize that's a great um, uh, uh, website. Unscrolling tissue is about the chamber depth. If you control the chamber depth and understand wave fluid moment, the movements, then you'll do very well with um, Demec. Tight scrolls can be managed as long as you manage the chamber depth. Recentering of the graft requires a small bubble that's proximal and rotation of the eye in the direction you want the tissue to move. And rebubbles done at the slit lamp with extension tubing is ergonomic, safer, and faster. Well, thank you to Charlie and to Nicholas and to Cindy for allowing me to be here on their Saturday afternoon. And uh, thank you very much for your attention on, on this first talk. Hey, Dr. Mark, you can go directly to uh, your second talk, please. Wonderful. The second talk, can you see that now? Yes. Okay. The second talk is about the dark side of DMAC complications and how to avoid them. Once again, these are my financial disclosures. 
And once again, please go to patientready.org, not .com, excuse me, patientready.org to understand the confirmations. This will help you to do DMACC, but also avoid the complications. Now, this is my second case I ever did 10 years ago. And this is the complication. I tried to use my DSAC skills for DMACC. So I injected the tissue, I came out, the tissue stuck in the interface. So I'm just going to nudge it in with irrigating the anterior chamber and raising the pressure and look what happens. And it's because I was using my DSAC skills to deepen the chamber that caused this complication. So how do you manage something like this? Well, first of all, you avoid it by keeping your chamber shallow and the pressure low at all times at mech when manipulating the tissue. You minimize any manipulation of the main wound. If the tissue is near the main wound and you manipulate by releasing fluid, the tissue will follow that. Never open the main wound with donor tissue is adjacent to it. You can sometimes get away with it if the donor tissue is further away from the main wound. Here's another case where I went through a previous cataract incision. I didn't realize that the incision was larger than my tube. And look what happens. I inject the tissue and it comes right out, right next to my tube. And I take out my injector. Now the tissue is half in and half out. So what do I do? I can either pull it in this way or I can pull it out. I decided to open the wound greater, pull up the wound to have less crush, pull it out, and then put it into a Petri dish that I have ready to go, reload it in the tissue, suture the wound tighter. So I've, I'm suturing this wound to make sure that it's tighter and I don't have the same problem occur. Now go in and very, very gently inject the tissue and maybe even remove some, uh, release some fluid. The tissue still wants to come out that way, but I don't keep injecting. I simply come out and I shallow my chamber even further to capture the tissue. I get inject a little more fluid, it still wants to come out. So I'm going to prevent it from coming out. This is, and this is the way you always should be, always careful to avoid having too large a wound. So if you have a FACO wound that was done by somebody else and you don't know what the dimensions of it were, or if it's very highly scarred, go to another location and on the eye and put a new wound. If the wound's too large, suture it to the right size for a tight for the injector tip. And I would say always have a Petri dish with BSS in it available to rescue your tissue and reload it into the injector. Here's another complication that can occur with Demec. This is a 46 year old engineer from the state of Montana. He had an uneventful Demec with FACO. On post-operative day one, the pressure was 55. He had severe pain and most importantly, the anterior chamber was three times its normal depth and I could not see any aqueous whatsoever in the anterior chamber and the pupil was dilated. So what is going on here? Is this just standard pupillary block? No, it's not. And the key is the fact that the anterior chamber is three times its normal depth and I cannot see any aqueous anywhere. So it's not pupillary block. What it is, is a mistake that we made in our operating room of having 100% concentration of SF6 in the, in the, in the uh, uh, bubble that I created and that will expand. It must be 20% or less concentration of SS6 if you're gonna use a gas. So the other important information is not only just to watch what your concentration is, but also to recognize that when you have an expanding gas, you have to remove all of it. You can't just remove enough of it. So I released the gas just till it was a 60% bubble and everything was great. The pressure was 10, the chamber was normal. But hours later, it continued to expand. As it continues to expand, it went again to 95% depth, abnormal depth. I again released it. 10 hours later, it expanded again. So the key is that you can't just expand, you have to remove all of, the, all of the gas, not just partial of it. Finally, after several removal of gas, six days later, he did very well and everything looks wonderful, but it'd been better off if one, I had avoided the complication by not having 100% gas and uh, concentration of gas. And number two, uh, releasing all the gas the first time I saw him and replacing it with just the air that I had from the room. So always verify with your nursing staff that SF6 is the proper concentration. And if expansion of the bubbles recognize, remove it all. Fibrin formation, this is my greatest fear of Demex surgery. And fibrin without blood occurs about 1% of the time. So if you have blood in the anterior chamber, the fibrin in the blood can cause problems with your Demex, but you see that immediately. There will be times when you do not see the fibrin um, uh, when you inject the tissue and that's where we have the greatest trouble. 
So if you have fiber inflammation in the back, the characteristic signs of it is after you inject the tissue, it gets tethered into the angle or the iris surface, and even directly irrigating at the tissue will not move it around. That tells you it's probably caught in fiber in your blood. Also, the longer you take of tapping and the worse the situation becomes, tapping should not change the situation on how the tissue is, is opening up. It should generally get easier. But if it starts getting worse, you know you're creating more and more fibrin with your tapping. And soon the fibrin strands be actually become visible with pigment on them. And then you know you're in deep trouble. And once the fibrin envelops the graft stroll, uh, uh, unscrolling becomes almost impossible, even if you eat, take the graft out and strip off the fibrin. Here's a, um, a video courtesy of Jeff Goshi, another fellow of mine at the Cleveland Clinic. And what he's showing is this is an OCT image. And you can see the fibrin has already started to hit this graft. He's tapping like crazy, trying to get this graft to open, but it's locked in with fibrin. And he's tapping and tapping and nothing's happening. And that's the first clue that you have. You don't need an OCT to show this. Another clue is he's irrigating at the tissue directly and the tissue's not moving. It's locked on to fibrin. Here again, he's got some of it loose here, but it's still locked on. He cannot get it to unlock because the fibrin is, is like glue. Now he's irrigated really hard, but it's still locked in over here. And even with sweeping, he's having a hard time uh, getting it to un, unleash. And so he knows he's got fibrin in this area. These are the signs of fibrin. So what about fibrin into mech? The prevention is, as we said, uh, after you strip your recipient desk maze, I recommend that you fill the anterior chamber of the recipient with air and an elevated pressure while you go to retrieve your donor tissue. Because we do know that a hypotony of the recipient can lead to bleeding from the angle and also fibrin formation. Before injecting the graft, we always do now a quick uh, IA sweep of the anterior chamber to make sure there's no fibrin or blood or vitreous in the anterior chamber. So we know what's going on at the chamber before we inject the tissue. After the, we inject the tissue, get it out of the angle. As soon as you got that tissue inside the eye and you, re you removed your injector, get, make sure that that angle is free of the um, tissue because that's where most of your fibrin comes from is from the angle. If your scroll is tethered to the iris surface during tapping, you, tapping you should su suspect fibrin. And if you uh, fibrin is suspected, put the tissue up on the posterior cornea, even if it's not completely unfolded, get it up away from the iris surface, get it up away from the angle immediately, and then you can have maneuvers to unscroll it on the back surface cornea. Now, if you've had fibrin in the first eye, I would take for the second eye of the, that same patient, pre-treat the patient with topical NSAIDs and oral steroids the day before and the day of surgery, and this can help to reduce fibrin in the second eye of that same patient. And then finally, just the worst, inter the worst uh, complication you can have with Demec or with Desaic or, or any of our lamellar procedures is infection. This is a patient, this is courtesy of um, Hide Yogagawa and Akira Kobayashi in Japan. They received a patient that was sent to them with all these colonies of candida in the interface on a Desaic graft. And um, the solution is not medical. I do not believe, I firmly believe that we should not be trying to treat these cases medically because the risk of endophthalmitis, the risk of this going beyond the, the, um, to, the, to the limbus is too high. I would recommend simply do a penetrating keratoplasty, completely remove the graft and the tissue, and you'll get a penetrating keratoplasty, which is still a wonderful operation. And this patient did quite well. So I, I propose that we cure interface infections on EK by doing a penetrating keratoplasty rather than irrigating out or treating medically. In summary then, Demec represents pure anatomic replacement surgery and unprecedented quality of vision for our patients. Like any surgery, there's a dark side. And certainly as Demec becomes more commonplace, there'll be other opportunities for us to explore this dark side. So thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Cindy. And thank you all for letting me be in part of this great webinar. Wonderful presentation as usual. Thank you very much, Dr. Mark Terry. And now we're moving to uh, Rajesh, uh, the magician of India regarding the DMEC surgery or the lamellar surgeries. Thank you, Azim. Uh, after this wonderful presentation by Dr. Mark Terry, I'll share some challenging scenarios where we perform DMEC surgery. 
Now, the first case is a one-eyed patient who's post-trab and post-multiple trabeculectomy surgery and a, a amid glaucoma valve implant. And he presented to us with this kind of a clinical picture with a edematous cornea and a 360 degree peripheral anterior sinicae. So the options uh, in a one-eyed patient to do a surgery, endothelial keratoplasty seemed to be the best option. But because of the peripheral anterior sinicae, even an ultra-thin DSEC graft may not be a great choice because of the recurrence of the, the high risk of recurrence of sinicae. So we went ahead, we did a, a sinicae lysis, then we did the decimate stripping. You can see that pigmented decimate membrane that we have removed from the eye. When we tried to form the anterior chamber with air, we found that it was not possible to retain the air because of the upthrust. So we went ahead and did the single port uh, core vitrectomy. We removed some of the anterior vitreous. After that, we found that we were able to keep the air bubble in the anterior chamber. We looked at the size of the ideal size of the graft that would fit. This came to about 7.25 millimeter. And we also trimmed the tube, which was protruding into the eye. We washed out all the viscoelastic from the anterior chamber. We decided to do a pull-through technique of insertion uh, because we didn't. We knew that uh, maybe maneuvering the graft in the anterior chamber would be difficult in this scenario. Uh, so we managed to put in our graft and unfold it. But the problem was once we unfolded it. By the time we unfolded, again, the pressure had built up, I think because of the misdirection of the fluid going into the vitreous cavity. So we again had to go back and remove a little bit of the fluid from the vitreous cavity, following which the space in the anterior chamber, uh, the, the anterior chamber deepened a bit, allowing us to maneuver the graft into the ideal position. And then we placed an air bubble and we completed the surgery. The peripheral part of the tube, we had to actually bring it down because otherwise the DMEC graft was not, uh, uh, you know, sitting in position. The graft, the tube was preventing that from happening. So this was the end of surgery. Uh, that's the early post-operative period where you can see that the, uh, the cornea is beginning to clear quite a lot. And this is uh, at one month when we saw the patient, you can see that his visual acuity improved to uh, 2030 and his pressures were well under control and the anterior chamber depth was nearly normal and uh, was maintained throughout the follow-up period without any recurrence of the sinicate. The second ch challenging scenario that we face is, uh, which I think uh, Dr. Baidun is going to talk about it, quarter DMEC. This is especially if you're going to prepare your own tissues and uh, unlike what you get a free strip tissue or a patient ready DMEC donor from the eye bank, when you're preparing your own tissue, yes, you can have uh, tears. So this was a case where we had a, a tear where uh, just about 40% of the tissue was available and the remaining 60% was lost. So we, and we had already prepared the recipient cornea. We had stripped a nice large nine millimeter area where we had removed the decimal. So we had no choice but to manage with this graft. And there was no S or an F stand that we had marked. So we stained uh, the donor tissue for a little longer period to get a nice stain. And then we uh, looked at the edge contour to see the way the edge was curling towards uh, the cornea, that means towards the surgeon and ensuring that it was in the right orientation. We managed to place the graft in the visual axis and then we completed the surgery by putting an air bubble in the anterior chamber. We expected that the bare area uh, of the stroma will have uh, corneal edema, which was seen in the early post-operative period. The central part of the cornea was clearer and the peripheral part did have edema. And however, uh, at one month later, when the patient came back for a follow-up, we, we, we were surprised to find that the entire cornea was clear, which was possibly because of the migration of cells from the uh, DMEC donor graft to the uh, bare area. And the patient had a good recovery of vision. This is another scenario where when you're trying to peel the graft, uh, usually we try to keep a little bit of the tripen glue dye uh, uh, staining the BSS because this helps us identify any tear that may be happening. Here you can see that we had a horseshoe tear. So we started dissecting uh, the, stripping the decimates from the opposite side and we managed to uh, complete the stripping. We stained the graft and when we are loading the graph, we try to make sure that 
uh, while inserting, we in, insert the intact part of the decimates first, and the tear, if it is present, it's on the uh, the 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 following edge, not at the leading edge, because if it's at the leading edge, sometimes it may get stuck on the iris, and you may find it difficult to flip over if required. So once it's inserted, we were able to open the graph. And you can see the F stamp there. So that indicates us that it's in the right, right orientation. And the that's the tear you can see there. That's a large tear, which finally we were able to position uh, centrally and then complete with a air bubble. That's how it looked in the post-operative period. Again, at one month, the, the tear did not affect the visual outcome in any way. This is a new device that I designed, which is, uh, currently uh, in, in the process of manufacturing. It's available from, should be available from Network Medical's Coronet, which is an illuminated endothelial punch. The advantage is that because of the retroillumination that you get from the LED lights, when you're stripping the decimates, your visualization of the edge of the decimates as, as it's being stripped is much better than when you're doing it on a trifine block. So this can, uh, you know, even identify abnormal areas of addition if you are having a uh, pseudophagic tissue, especially at the main incision and the side ports, uh, you can identify abnormal areas of addition. And if you do have a complication like a tear, that can be also be identified much sooner. So this we found that uh, this uh, speeds up your process of stripping the decimates. And at the same time, because of the improved visualization, maybe you can identify the complication much earlier and prevent the tear from becoming a large one. The other problem that you have is intraoperative bleeding. So this is one of my fellows when they were doing the DMAX surgery, everything seemed to be going fine. Uh, he's putting the graph into the eye. It's not really very uh, densely stained and he's trying to flip it over. And by the time he was tapping to open it up and it, everything seemed you know, uh, going smoothly and we were relaxing. And I was just about to tell him that, okay, now you can place your air bubble below the graph but he wanted to center it perfectly. And there was a small fold in the periphery. And you can see that suddenly from the inferior peripheral iridectomy, it started to bleed. And this possibly happened because the, uh, the peribulb anesthesia was starting to wear off and the patient was experiencing pain. Patient was uncomfortable. So the blood pressure shot up. Uh, the systolic pressure was almost uh, going up to about 200 millimeters of mercury. Possibly that resulted in, you know, the, the, bleeding from the surgical PI. And I took over at this point of time to try and see if I could salvage the situation by quickly irrigating out the, uh, uh, the blood from the eye and preventing the formation of fibrin and unfold the graft and put an air bubble. Um, uh, but even in my experience hand, things continued to worsen despite all the maneuvers that we took. And finally, at the end, we tried putting an air bubble to control the bleeding. We tried almost everything, connecting an AC maintainer at one point. But uh, you know, you have to learn when to give away, give up as well. So we decided that uh, the, the, the completion of surgery would not be possible. So we removed the donor DM, we put a large air bubble, and we ended the surgery at that point of time. We went back uh, a week later. And by then uh, the, the bleeding would have definitely come under good control and we were able to complete the surgery. Just we had to use another donor cornea for this purpose. We gave a good thorough wash of the anterior chamber, stained the decimates better this time, put in the graft, opened it up and we placed a large air bubble and patient had a good outcome despite having the bleed the first time. And as uh, Mark Terry pointed out that yes, you can do an intensive treatment with topical steroid, use NSAID to prevent a recurrence of the fibrin or the bleeding the second time when you do that. So surgical modifications are required in difficult situations. Uh, damage to donor DM during preparation can be managed. Uh, at least in my hands, a tissue wastage rate is very low. And I think that once you uh, overcome the learning curve of preparing the donor DM yourself, the tissue wastage rates would be less than one to two percent. And if you, even if you do damage the donor tissue, you can still salvage and you can still do a hemidimac or a quarter dimac. And only thing is, yes, if you are going, to, maybe you prepare the donor first and depending on the size of the donor that you have, you can then strip the recipient bed accordingly, according to the size of the donor you have. If you strip a very large area and then you have a smaller graft, 
maybe you will have a much uh, longer duration of the persistent edema postoperatively, so that can be uh, looked at. Intraoperative bleeding remains a potential complication and can be managed, especially if the donor DM is still inside the eye and it's not yet opened up completely. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Dr. Rajesh, for a fantastic uh, presentation. And now we are moving to uh, Dr. Lamise Baidun again and uh, a novel technique uh, for uh, tissue saving. Go ahead, Lamise, please. Okay, now you're hearing me, right? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I am lucky that I don't need to show you my nightmares <laughs> like the others have shown you. So I'm, I will show you quarter DMEC, this novel technique to um, spare tissue, but also for central Fuchs. And you've seen a very nice indication from Dr. Fogler that when we know that these small grafts work, then you don't worry if your graft tears. So after these quarter grafts and hemi grafts, we actually are very comfortable with that. I cannot um, advance my slides. Can you help me how to advance the slides? Uh, click on the slide. I'm clicking on the slide. Oh, okay, good, thanks. Well, I've shown you this kind of um, picture already with the Bowman layer and Gerrit Menes also did the first DMEX surgery in 2006. I um, will show you the technique after standardizing it, how uh, this is performed. And here you see the standardized technique, how we do it in, the, in Rotterdam. You saw the double roll. Um, we inject the graft. We did before a decimeter axis under air. And now you see how we, we unfold it with the cannula on top of the cornea and then put an air bubble, put a little bit of fluid to, re, to center the graft by um, making the air bubble a little bit smaller. And here you see how we move the graft. And there you've seen the techniques earlier also from our colleagues, uh, which are used to unfold the graft. And now you remove the air bubble and inject it underneath the graft to fixate it. So this is the standardized technique with a normal 8.5 to 9.5 graft. And with a gra with the technique I will show you now, you see that this can differ a little bit, but it mainly is similar. So we moved on with standardized uh, quarter D, uh, with standardized DMEC, uh, which I said is an 8.5 to 9.5 graft. And we thought, why not using a small, uh, same size graft, but cutting the donor in two halves? So then we came up with Hemi DMEC. And um, although DMEC, uh, standard DMEC shows uh, very good fast and uh, good outcomes with visual acuity, we, we noticed that the, with Hemi DMEC, this is similar, although we might have areas that have bare stroma, as you heard from Dr. Fogler, that might um, clear a little bit less quickly. So uh, with the DMEC modifications that came up and in 2016, we cut the Hemi DMEC graft in two halves. Here we had the thought of increasing tissue availability even more for endothelial tissue and uh, at the same time using it for a different kind of uh, disease or uh, especially kind disease. So quarter DMEC has the, the advantage that you put a graft in the center of the cornea where the cornea is edematous and uh, in comparison to decimeter axis only you have to faster visual rehabilitation because of the faster corneal clearance. So like with DMAC, we know DMAC was invented because we wanted to um, selectively replace the tissue that was diseased. So this we thought further and thought, why do we treat all Fuchs eyes in the same way? Why do get eyes that have a diffused edema in Fuchs, advanced Fuchs, the same graft as eyes that have only localized edema or almost no edema at all 
just suffering from gute that are doing that are causing stray lights and visual re um, deterioration, for example, during the night. So this is why we thought of quadrademic. So these eyes. So who's the patient actually? These eyes are eyes that only have, you see central gutte on the slit lamp, mainly in this six to, six to seven millimeter zone. And um, when you look at the specular microscopy, you may see that the central picture is really blurry and you cannot really make out any endothelial cells, but in the periphery, you still have nice cells. And as you again heard from Dr. Fogler, these cells migrate as well as the cells from the graft and can clear the cornea. So therefore we thought, why not doing a smaller axis, remaining endothelial healthy cells in the periphery, and by inserting a smaller graft, you may have even less rejection, even though it's already quite low with DMAC. So the quarter DMAC surgery is actually the same way as with standard DMAC. After a decimeter axis, you inject the graft, and um, you try to unfold it, center it, lift it, and put the air underneath, and remove the air um, partially, uh, to uh, have the graft fixated. But still there are some differences. And here I will show you um, a quarter DMAX surgery. And the video has been done by our colleague, Philip Dockery. Thank you for this. I was doing the surgery here. And the difference between this surgery and the one after that is that here you have a pseudophagic eye and um, the chamber is a little bit deeper. So you see I'm doing a smaller decimeterexis and um, after that, you strip this decimus membrane. See you here. Normally we do a nine millimeter, but here I keep it a little bit smaller. So from here, it's a little bit oval. And then you strip the whole area. You keep the peripheral cells. We measured this. And we normally do the rexus under air to also dehydrate the cornea so that you have less edema. And here you see the central decimate is now all released. So now we do a three by three millimeter tunnel at 12 o'clock. Just the same way like with standard DMEC, we remove the decime. And in this case, we had some stromal or residual decimate. So therefore we scrape this area, we wash out the air bubble, just like in standard DMAC. And now um, we will flatten the chamber. This is very important for quarter DMAC because the graph just behaves differently. It's very small and a deeper chamber is just very difficult to handle the graft in. So here you see, now the graft injected. And from the maneuvers, you will realize it's a little bit more difficult to unfold it. You should remove all air bubbles that are, may interfere with your unfolding. So therefore I will remove them, remove them here. And then you see, I try to tap on top shallowing the air, the chamber. Since we know that the round edge of the quarter DMAC sometimes delays with corneal clearance, you should make sure that the, the pupillary area is nicely centered by the quarter DMAC graft so that not the, the central cornea remains edematous, rather peripheral areas remain edematous. See here, the as soon as you have the the, the, the graft, the chamber a little bit deeper again, it scrolls up again. So it's quite difficult to uh, maneuver a quarter DMAC since it's a small graft. So here you see now it's unfolded, but still not positioned nicely. So you have to release the air again, trying to keep the chamber flat to be able to move your graft to where you want it maybe sometimes easier to secure the graft by having a little air bubble on top. And here it is almost centered. You see some areas are not unfolded. These are will be unfolded after the air bubble is injected. What is difficult with these quarter DMAC grafts, you've seen that in the video of Mark Terry, that the graft often moves while you try, try to lift it. 
So sometimes you have to really um, be quick and with a flat chamber, this is much easier. And here you see a case with a fake eye, thanks to Sorsha Nidwal who edited this video. No, this is um, still the same one. So this is the video of uh, my colleague edited Sorsha Nidwal, thank you for this. So here I'm doing a fake eye. You see it's, it's much more straightforward because you don't have this deep chamber. Again, an oval um, smaller decimetrexis of six to seven millimeters. You have to be careful here since it's fake to not manipulate too much over the, eye, the um, lens area. The rexis is the stripping is done. Then you do a the incision. Make also sure that you don't go inside with your with your um, knife, since you have your lens um, there, so that you don't damage it. So this is the way how I do it normally. I incise it from the periphery. And here you inject the quarter demac graft. I stay at the pupillary area, and this one is much more straightforward, just centering it and almost done. Dr. Lamine, sorry for interruption. Uh, we have a question from uh, Dr. Abdurrahman Atalla. Yeah. Uh, it says, Dr. Baidun, how do you prepare the hemi and the quarter demac grafts? Yes. Um, I can, I have actually hidden that slide. If you want me, I can show that you, to you after I've, I, I um, finish this video. So this is just the lifting. And after you lift it, it's done. And in conclusion, um, this DMEC, uh, quarter DMEC modification and also HEMI DMEC actually is a fe feasible preparation and surgical technique. It may also be sufficient for eyes with Fuchs dystrophy and um, if long-term outcomes, because visual outcome is actually very good as well, as good as in standard DMAC, then um, this may be a potential technique to quadruple the donor endothelial tissue. I thank you and I will go out for a second to show you the preparation um, slide. So here you see the preparation of the quarter DMEC. You're seeing that slide? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it starts actually just like with the standard um, uh, no touch preparation technique. We normally loosen the um, trabecular meshwork with a, with a hockey knife from 30, 360 degrees. And um, in standard DMEC, you normally loosen it and then you strip it the way you saw it in um, Dr. Fogler's presentation. With a McPherson, we do that with one forceps. And after that, we trefine it and have the roll. In this case, we cut the donor button already in halves. And this is the step where we would have a hemi DMEC because then we would strip from the loosened um, uh, trabecular meshwork, the graft. Uh, if we would have a quarter DMEC prepared, we would cut it again in two halves and strip every quarter by itself, like you see here, so that you get um, little tiny sweet quarter DMEC babies <laughs> in the Petri dish. <laughs> this is how we do it. Is it clear? Thank you very much, Dr. Lemis, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And now we're gonna go for the last part of our uh, meeting today, the stem cell corneal surgery by Dr. Sharif Hosni. Uh, Dr. Sharif, would you please unmute yourself? Unmute yourself, yes. Is it clear now? Yes. Okay. Uh, of course, all of us know the causes of limb cell deficiency as congenital iridia, idiopathic conditions, uh, chemical and thermal burns, iatrogenic uh, surgery and contact lens use, and autoimmune cases as Stephen Johnson syndrome and OCP.
condition as limbic cell deficiency represents a major clinical challenge and conventional coronary transplants alone are destined to fail in such conditions due to absence of axillary cross. Uh, limbic stem cells gained uh, an interest since the location was exactly discovered and described. Uh, the first paper which was published about limbic cell transplants was Pellegrini et al. 1997, and he first described the ex vivo expanded limbic cell stem transplants. Now it's considered as an advanced therapy medical product and already sold commercially. This is the paper which was published at the time and it showed a success in about 112 patients. Uh, so we designed the study here, which started in uh, 2014, and uh, we have chosen to deal with one etiology of limbic stem cells, which is the chemical burns. We refuse to deal with other etiologies as they have other uh, basic uh, pathologies which cannot be uh, dealt with. Uh, five patients were selected as a start for the study, and all of them have previous ocular chemical burns. Other new patients were added consecutively. As I told you, the, start, the, uh, the paper started by 2014. All affected eyes, the limbus and the cornea was totally damaged with conjunctivalization. Their vision was hand movement, and the surgical procedure was started after receiving the usual medical treatment for chemical burns after six months. This is the technique. We used a fresh or frozen amniotic membrane prepared by the eye bank, denuded by trypsin and editor, and the nipple explant is placed over it, and then we place it in a culture media which includes all these uh, material. A fresh frozen amniotic membrane, about five by five centimeter, is purchased from the eye bank and screened for infectious diseases as HB, HCV, HBV, and HIV. Uh, amniotic membrane is denuded by a thermolysin enzyme. Amniotic membrane will be stretched uh, and label explants cultured over it and submerge it in the gross medium for 10 14 days. Uh, all of this culture is placed in a CO2 incubator at three, 37 degrees centigrade, 98% humidity, and 5% uh, carbon dioxide concentrations. Sorry for these details, but I have to mention the technique. Uh, let's tell you how to prepare the implant, and I call it uh, the cell factory, limbic cell factory. You have two sources of the implant, either uh, autologous uh, source from the other eye of the patient or uh, non-autologous uh, one, homologous one. You take it from uh, a cadaver or a limbal uh, graft from cornea. Uh, as you see, uh, the techniques are described in the photographs. You take the usual techniques by auto plants, two by one millimeter, excised from the limbus in the usual way we deal with in the regular non-explanted uh, form. Allografts are transferred in the same way uh, from fresh, uh, to the fresh excised limbal corneal button rings. These grafts will be implanted on a denuded amniotic membrane, as I told you before. These are examples of the material that we use. This is the incubator, inverted microscope for the follow-up of the uh, gross culture. So we need a laminar airflow, carbon dioxide incubator, and inverted PC microscope. This is how the cells explant, uh, grew from the explant, which is placed on the amniotic membrane, a follow-up picture where every day was taken, and this is how cell grew uh, from the explant on the amniotic membrane in the medium. This state day two cross, day 10. Day 12, after the amniotic membrane have been totally uh, grown uh, and covered by multi layers of uh, epithelial and limbal stem cells. Of course, we have to have a clinical clue or a uh, lab clue for such type of cells. So we do all the samples at the day 14 of culture, corneal phenotyping, uh, to be proved by PCR using P63 and CK3 and 12 molecular tests. When the amniotic membrane is sufficiently expanded uh, and all the limbal cells within 14 days, it's transplanted to the eye to start the surgery. This is an example of different kinds of colonies I don't want to go through at this late time of the night but it is an example of how cells grew in our culture. The surgical steps, the conjunctiva is dissected as a periotomy 360 degree, and the cultured amniotic membrane is transferred with cell facing up and the limbal implant on it. 
uh, and sutured to the limbus by 80 nylon, cultured and nerve membrane left to stabilize and enrich the corneal surface with cultured limbal cells for six months. PKP uh, was secondary cultured and done uh, after the amniotic membrane has been left on the eye for six months and patients who have allografts received cyclosporin 1% eye drops three times daily for two months. Example of our first case, to the left-hand side, uh, this is an example of an allograft transplant. On the left side, the previous pre the visual acuity was hand movement. On the right-hand side, the post the visual acuity turned to be counting finger one meter after we removed the uh, conjunctival tissue covering the cornea and we implanted our amniotic membrane cultured by limbal cells. We leave this cornea for six months and later on we do the patient penetrating keratoplasty and the stem cells are covering and enriching the medium. And this is how it looked like after six months, we gained, we gained a visual acuity of 0.1. One hallmark sign here is the limbal conjunctival cells failing now to reach and cover and cross over the limbal and cells and they cannot cover the cornea now. They uh, rush up and down and they never cover the cornea again. One of the patients failed and uh, we took his cornea to be uh, histopathologically examined. And this is an example of the hematoxin and you've seen samples done for the epithelium and different ramifications. And we did him also a PASS test, which proved to be negative, cytokine 19 test, which proved negative. All these are pathological clues that we have now grown corneal epithelial cells. Our second case, we did an allograft because all both eyes were burned. And to the left hand side, for example, this is the pre optic visual acuity hand movement. Six months later, after implanting the membrane with the cells on it, the visual acuity reached two meters. Later on, after six months, we did the patient uh, keratoplasty and he uh, reached a good visual acuity as 0.1 to 0.2. The third case, we did autografting because we have only one affected eye. And to the left hand side, this is the pre optic visual acuity hand movement. The right hand side, the visual acuity counting finger one meter after we implanted the amniotic membrane and we excised the conjunctival tissue. It's very important to excise all the conjunctival tissue with the vascularization, creeping on the cornea, and to keep a clear medium and start building a new barrier on the cornea with the amniotic cells that you have. This is the idea about this uh, surgery, to implant the cornea with a population and a colony of cells of epithelial nature. The follow-up of the patient through uh, the six months uh, and uh, started uh, clearing up and later on when the patient grafted his cornea, we reached a visual acuity 0.2. And as you see, the limbus here, you never have the conjunctival vessels crossing over the cornea again because it is populated by limbal cells. A fourth case, uh, we did an allograft also. I don't want to go through the same details. A fifth uh, case, in the fifth patient, we have an autograft failure. The cause is unknown but the patient started to grow vascularization of the cornea within one month. So these are our results, initial results. Three allografts and two uh, autografts were done. Two patients gained unaided vision 0.1. One patient gained unaided vision 0.2. The fourth patient gained unaided vision 0.2, maintained for four years. Regarding the surface vascularization, three cases maintained graft clarity now. One patient have a graph of vascularization in two quadrants, and the fifth one suffered from total vascularization and graft failure. So our conclusion is that patients with conjunctival chemical burns, chemical burns mainly, which have no other pathology, uh, have a new hope with overall success rate of 80% according to our study. Ex vivo limbal cell implants are a good solution for restoring a new a vascular cornea and ready to receive a corneal implant. The question is how long these cells are surviving. Uh, our results show that long-term follow-up will they usually last for two to five years. Then vascularization starts to grow again and invade the cornea. 
What should we do to potentiate the residual limbal cells to multiply and produce extra cells in a further research area? And we should gain uh, local ethical committee's approval here for this technique to continue with large volume studies. Thank you very much. Well, uh, this concludes our session for today. And uh, I'm uh, thanking uh, Dr. Lamise Baidun and I'm thanking all the participants and I'm thanking all the international guests from different countries. Uh, we have some questions, but uh, for the sake of time, uh, I'm concluding this session. And again, I'm thanking the um, technical support, Professor Dr. Fathi Fauzi, Dr. Nader Fauzi for uh, organizing this uh, first night of uh, uh, Watany Web Week with uh, some bedtime stories. Thank you very much. Thank you.